Swearingen. Here. Craig. Jagler. Here. Branchen. Here. Clayfish. Here. Gannon. Here. Rip. Culp. Tauken. Here. Forpoggle. Here. Tamripa. Here. Sinicki. Here. Call. Here. Onstead. Here. Brostoff. Here. We'll be moving into executive session. Uh, the committee will be voting on two bills, AB 120, followed by AB 165. After executive session, we'll move into a public hearing uh, for the purpose of hearing testimony on just one bill today, AB 194. If you want to speak on AB 194, you uh, just see the committee clerk, rather the, uh, the Scott in the corner there, <laughs> to fill out an assembly hearing slip uh, to make sure that we uh, have your name recorded uh, on file here. So with that, we'll move into executive session. We'll talk about Assembly Bill 120. Uh, there is no amendments to AB 120, and I'll ask Legislative Council to uh, give us an overview of the bill. Sure. Assembly Bill 120 creates a correction system formulary board. That board would promulgate rules to establish a guideline and procedures governing pharmacist selections of alternative therapeutic drugs for prisoners in state correctional facilities. The board would consist of two physicians and a pharmacist appointed by the secretary of the Department of Corrections, um, who, and the members would serve at the pleasure of the DOC secretary. And the board would also consist of any other members that the secretary appoints. Move passage. Second. Motion by Representative Clayfish, second by Representative Gannon for passage. Uh, is there any further discussion on AB 120? Seeing none, I'll have the clerk take the roll. Swearingen. Aye. Jagler. Aye. Branchen. Aye. Clayfish. Aye. Gannon. Aye. Tauken. Aye. Forpoggle. Aye. Samaripa. Aye. Sinicki. Aye. Call. Aye. Onstead. Aye. Brossoff. Aye. <coughs> With that then, we will move to AB 165. Once again, there are no amendments uh, to AB 165. Uh, and I will ask Legislative Council to uh, give us another overview of AB 165. Sure. Assembly Bill 165 authorizes towns to enact shoreland zoning ordinances for any shoreland areas that are not already subject to a county shoreland zoning ordinance. Um, as is the case under current law, if a town has an ordinance in place before a county ordinance is adopted, the bill allows the town to continue to enforce the portion of the town ordinance that is more restrictive than the county ordinance. I will entertain a motion for passage. Move. Motion by Representative Talkin. Second. Second by Representative Jagler. Any further discussion on AB 165? Seeing none, I will have the clerk call the roll. Swearingen. Aye. Jagler. Aye. Branchen. Aye. Clayfish. Aye. Gannon. Aye. Rip. Talkin. Aye. Forpoggle. Aye. Samaripa. Aye. Sinicki. Aye. Call. Aye. Onstead. Aye. Brostoff. Aye. Uh, seeing no objection, I'll like, like to uh, convene the public hearing, but I'm going to hold open the, um, or rather hold off on the, adjour uh, the adjournment of the executive session so the remaining members can register their vote uh, if they come in, if there's no objection. So with that, I would like to convene the public hearing on Assembly Bill 194. We're going to hold the roll. Uh, we're going to hold that roll open, yep. And so we'll we'll open up the re uh, hearing on AB 194. And I would ask uh, the author of the bill to come forward. Representative Edming, how are you today? Fantastic. <laughs> Welcome to State Affairs and Government Operations. Thank you. You have the floor. Hello, everyone. This is my first. Uh, this is really the maiden journey. Well, we're honored you're here in front of this committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Freshmen are allowed to eh? Oh, yeah. Team of horses couldn't stop. They don't cost any money. This one doesn't. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding a hearing on Senate Bill or Assembly Bill uh, 194 and allowing me to testify uh, in favor of this legislation. Assembly Bill 194 is a bill that requires students of all schools, public schools, uh, uh, that. The, to pass the civics test portion of the citizenship test in order to graduate from high school. Uh, this bill is part of a nationwide movement to increase student knowledge and exposure in a, in a foundational uh, principles of government, history, law, and democracy. This common sense legislation has been passed in six other states, including Arizona and North Dakota. Under the bill, students would be given a hundred hundred question immigration and naturalization exam pertaining to government and history. This exam is presently utilized by the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. A score of 60 is required to pass the test and may be taken uh, re and retaken until a passing score is attained. Some of the questions include how many justices are on the Supreme Court? Uh, what do we call the first 10, am 10 amendments to the Constitution? Who vetoes a bill? Uh, these may appear to be relatively simple. May, may appear to be relatively simple questions for many, but for many young Americans, they are not. A recent study conducted by the Annenberg uh, Public uh, Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania found that only 36 percent of adults could name all three branches of the government, and another 35 percent could not name any. 27% of those surveyed knew that a two-thirds vote by both House and Congress is needed to overturn a presidential veto. It is critical for students to comprehend that the principles which, were for, which formed our country are still revel, relevant today. I believe that preparation for this exam can be used to foster greater civic partic participation and can help empower them to become engaged uh, citizens within the society. For centuries, our veterans have fought and died to preserve our country, and therefore, I consider it our civic duty to instill a greater appreciation for the sacrifice and service of those who made our country what it is today. This bill creates an opportunity for students to learn more about the foundations of our country and the freedom that we enjoy today, because we are requiring to use a test that has already been developed. There are, there are no significant state fiscal imp implications with the bill can be applied beginning in the two, six, in 2016 and 17 school year. This bill is not an unnecessary mandate, but an avenue to ensure that our students fully understand the traditions and history of the United States. Thank you for your time and attention, and I ask that you support this legislation, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative Edming, for your testimony. So. This is just kind of like a uh, government 101 civics test, huh? Yes, yes. Uh, a, a lot of the, most of most of this material has been presented to the students prior to entering high school, and it's just a way that we know that these that these students have a better understanding and fully understand how this country was put together and how it was founded. And you indicated there's six states that currently have this. Yes. I guess I'm surprised there's not more. Yeah, it's, it, there's just, I believe there's just, the, the movement is just coming across. And that's how, and that's how, how I got wind of this. Uh, uh, it's, it's that, I, and, and years ago I was a school teacher. And, and, uh, and, and, and I think that this is just part, this is just part of be, becoming a good American, is to know as much about you can, uh, about as much of it as what you, what you can, what you can learn. You went from school teacher to oil tycoon. Yes, sir. <laughs> and frozen pizzas. And frozen pizzas <laughs> in between or, or all at once. Yeah. <laughs> Representative Sinicki. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually have um, two, possibly three questions for me. Yeah. And the first one, Mr. Chair, is actually for you as the committee chair. <laughs> sure. I, I just, I want to, I'm kind of confused. Um, now, this bill was introduced on Monday. Uh, and, and it's in this committee today which I understand this committee is kind of a catch-all, you know, for bills that you want to rush through. And, and I understand that. And, you know, sometimes this committee is used in a good way to do that. We have bills that do have to pass very quickly. I don't understand why this bill is in this committee so quickly 
they set up in the education committee where that committee is purposely assigned uh, people who have some knowledge on education issues. And then uh, Representative Jagler and I, I believe, are the only two on this committee that also serve on the education committee. Am I correct? I, I'm pretty sure I'm right on that. And that concerns me because we're making decisions on education with a group of people who have no knowledge of education. So can you mm, sure. talk about that? Yeah, uh, and I, uh, I don't disagree. I don't know exactly why it's in this committee either, other than uh, it is the speaker's prerogative, obviously, to forward any bill to uh, right. any committee that he sees fit. Uh, there, at this point, uh, we had an executive session today, uh, so it's easy for us to hear this bill. Uh, I, at this point, also have no executive session for this bill in the near future. Uh, so we're just simply hearing this bill. Uh, that could change. Uh, I don't know how soon this could or could not make it to the floor, depending on uh, the rules process. Uh, so, uh, but you're right, this is the State Affairs and Government Operations Committee, uh, and we can also argue that uh, uh, State Affairs is kind of the catch-all for this, for this bills like this. So, uh, as chair, I suppose I could have uh, uh, asked the speaker's office uh, to direct this bill to a different committee. However, uh, uh, also as chair, I'm happy to hear it. Uh, and that's part of the fun of being on the State Affairs and Government Operations Committee, in my opinion. So uh, I was happy to hear this bill uh, for the speaker's office and for Representative Edmund. Okay. Uh, thank you, yep. Mr. Chair. And, um, I don't think anybody disagrees that our, our children should know how government works, first of all, I want to say that. But I, and, and I apologize, Representative, um, this is your first bill, and I think you're going to be peppered with quite a few questions from this side of the committee, so um, I'm going to apologize up front. I use that question. So, just my first question is, I've got one, maybe two. Um, my first question is, before you started your, your um, written testimony, you said that this bill was not going to cost any money. And I'm wondering how you came to that because this is going to be an extra mandate on the schools. So it is going to cost our local school district some money. Have you asked for a fiscal estimate on this bill? Uh, for, first off, the, the test itself is, is, uh, uh, is, is presently used for the immigration. So the test is all done. And, and if I was back in the classroom, I would integrate this there's 180 days of school in high school, and you have four years to do it. Now, you can, the, the students can take this test first week to come to high school if they want to and totally get it out of the way. But as far as, far as the cost, there's no generating of any, anything to it. And I don't know how, I don't know how you could ever put a, a price on something that a teacher could integrate right into their civics class. I mean, uh, uh, so, Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Um, I believe the cost is going to come in. I mean, how do I how do I put this into a question form? I, I mean, you are aware that we have cut education so drastically, K twelve education so drastically in the past four years, and this is going to be a cost. And I'm going to ask you again: Did you did you request a fiscal estimate? I did. I did not request. I would, a I would ask. That you, I, I, I did. I did not ask that. I would. I would. If you don't want to do it, I will request <coughs> a fiscal estimate on this bill because I do believe there is going to be a cost to our local school districts who can't afford it. Um, one more quick question: Now that others ask theirs, while I, um, so they can all have a chance. I was looking at. <coughs> the GAB list of who has registered for and against this bill. Thank you. Um, did somebody actually come to you and ask you to draft this bill? No. Nobody, nobody, nobody has requested this bill. Um, follow up, please. Um, have you reached out to any of our local school districts, our educators, to see how this could be implemented in the classroom? I personally haven't, but I think with my past experience, I think I answered that already. I know. I realize you're an educator. Yeah. I used um, to be. You used to be. You used to be an educator. I mean, I if I would, I would suggest you reach out to to local superintendents, local teachers, local school boards, to ask them how this would be implemented. Um, because what I, so I look at the list and I see one person, in, one group in favor of this, and it's Lockbridge, Brindle, Nolan. Can you tell me who that is? Where are you at? 
you may not know. On behalf of CPI. I don't know. She's on her own. If you don't know, you don't know. Okay, I'm just curious if you don't. Because my understanding is it's a Minnesota company. And, um, and, uh, I, and we did discover things to get the, our, our great committee staff that this actually is a nationwide bill that is going nationwide by Alec. <clears throat> so I just want to put that out there. I've never been to an Alec function, so you so, can. Um, <laughs> I have not had a chance to actually look at the bill and see if it's worth the work for Alex. <laughs> Alex, um, um, sample bill. But my image is going to be. So I just ask you to reach out to those people who actually have to work with this. And I'm going to let the rest of the committee ask questions, but I know I have plenty more. Yeah, no First of all, I have a question for the Ledge Council. Does this bill require a testing? No. It does not require a I think it does. Okay. okay. Representative Gannon. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I ask what bills require a fiscal and which ones don't? A fiscal one, sir. <laughs> 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 Just some don't. It's a determination made, determination made by the drafter. Um, so it's the reference bureau that makes that determination when they're putting the bill together. And um, just generally speaking, if they think that there might be some kind of physical okay, construction bill, then they, they can take that in the bill, and if they don't, okay. uh, Mr. Chair, my question was answered. I was concerned about how they would tie this into the classroom, but I'm sure it sounds like it's easy to do so like that. Okay. Representative Andrew. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Representative Edmund, for your testimony. Thank you. Um, so this is your first bill? Yes. You said this is your your maiden journey? Yes. Um, I did want to ask, you know, we have a lot of pressing issues before our state right now. We have job growth <clears throat> continuing to lag. We know that we're last in the nation in terms of middle class growth. We just heard today from the Legislative Fiscal Bureau that we will um, be receiving zero additional tax revenue. Um, and so I'm wondering why why this bill first? Uh, when we have all these pressing issues before us, what makes you so passionate uh, to, to make this part of your maiden journey, your very first bill, requiring uh, students in Wisconsin to pass a citizenship test? Well, I, I, just, I just think that it's very important. Uh, 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 not, o not only because of my, my past um, experiences. Uh, an answer to the, probably to answer your question the best, there was a, there used to be a TV show on called uh, Jay Leno. And he used to have what was called jaywalking. And he would ask people just, I mean, some pretty different questions, you know. And they didn't know who the President of the United States was. And, and I think if we can, when, when you graduate from high school, you should have somewhat of a, of a well-rounded education to get out of there, and then if you continue your education beyond that. However, uh, uh, some of these things, uh, uh, it's been 50 some years since I've been in the, since I graduated from high school, and I passed it on the first go around after 50 years. So, and, you can still get 40 of them wrong, and, and, and as uh, the teachers can present this throughout their uh, uh, the, the, the semester, and I don't, I don't know how you, could ever, how you could ever put a price on, if you were teaching algebra class, and you're going to have what uh, pi r squared, what it really means, how, how you would get a, because this is, this is part of our education. Follow up? Sure. Um, thank you. So I, you're a freshman now. Yes. I was a freshman in 2011. It was the first um, year that it was the first term where the Republicans came in a big wave, huge majority, and Governor Walker um, won the gubernatorial race, as you know. They also implemented the most devastating cuts to public education in the history of our state, largest cuts we've seen in my lifetime. 2011, when I was a freshman. Now. You're, you would be forcing more this to become law, high stakes test, in the wake of these continued cuts to public education. You know, are you concerned at all uh, because of the cuts we're already making to public education, not just back in 2011, and we're still suffering those ripple effects, but even in this biennial budget today, aren't you concerned about forcing a mandate on our schools across the board from public to charter to choice? Um, you're just further crippling 
our students and our educational system? If this isn't part of, of, our edu of our basic education, nothing is. Nothing is if this is not part of the basic education. And, and there are just some things when you come out of school, you should, you should be able to get 40 out of, uh, out of 100 questions, or 60 out of 100 questions. It, it's, not, it, it's not rocket science. It's, it's merely, this is our heritage, this is how America was founded, and, and, and a simple question on, on, this, on this test is, what did the stripes on the American flag stand for? And it's a multiple choice. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not that our educators are going to have to sit down and study and cram and go to summer school and take a couple seminars to, to learn how to do this. These are things that we are already teaching in school, but it's just merely so we know when Jay Leno hits them on the street again, they have somewhat chance of making it. And you answered my next question. I was going to, what is the format of the test? It's a multiple choice test. Here. It's a multiple choice test. I don't have it. I don't have it with me. So it's not an oral based test. It doesn't. I don't it's an it's oral based way. test if you come in as an immigrant from a foreign country. But it's the exact same test that they take. Now there's also uh, uh, when the immigrants take it, they don't have to take the hundred. They take ten. But they switch. They switch around ten. Uh, uh, they can pick out any ten they want. They want to pick. But will our students be subjected to an oral test or a written test? Is it multiple choice? It's, it's a written test. Answers? It's a written test. Uh, I, I would hope that they don't have any... Well, that's not for you guys. I guess you'd have to... Sir, is this format spelled out in the bill around what the is the format for the test spelled out in the bill? I don't know what it is. It doesn't sound like you're certain either. Can, you got it there, Representative? The analysis by the Legislative Reference Bureau. That's what you want me to read? No. The question is, uh, is, is the type of test, multiple choice, spelled out in the bill, how, how the test is going to be administered? And what it looks like. The test, the test itself. Yes. Darla? Why? Huh? Can you help me with that one? It's actually, it's actually up to the individual school district um, whether or not they would like to do multiple choice. So we kind of give that type of autonomy to the school district. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Representative Jansen. Branchin. General Branchin. <laughs> that was putting all it in one syllable. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you, Representative I just wanted to know, were you aware that this test is available online? Yes, it is. It is online. So you're saying that there would be multiple options for teachers to use classroom via computer, paper, whatever you have not, as I assume on this bill, been spelled out an exact test or a written test, but you've left it in for us to your citizenship. So is that what you to say? Correct. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much as a freshman. I know how nerve-wracking this process can be, so I appreciate you and uh, appreciate your interest in civics and in uh, engagement in, in curriculum as well. Um, I have a couple uh, just quick clarifying questions. Um, first of all, the idea that, uh, you know, it, it sounds like the spirit of this, that, that the nature and the essence of where this is coming from is that you want to have our students more engaged in American history and in civics, and to better understand as a lot of those who pass this is citizenship test do, although this is more strict, but it's along the same lines, right? Yeah. It's supposed to have 10 questions, this is 60, but along the same lines. If that's the case, and if you want this mandated through our schools, why wouldn't you have reached out to the school districts and talked to the people who are doing this work on the ground? I, I think I answered that question earlier, but I, as, as my past experience as of, of ed, in education, uh, I think you're trying to make a mountain out of a molehill out of this, and and because because it's all it, it's so simple, and 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 like like the representative here said, it's also online. I mean, you, you you don't have to you don't have to spend hours preparing for this. Yeah. So. Um just to, to clarify and to follow up the context of, of what I'm saying, I agree. In a vacuum, this is very 60 out of 100 questions. 
Uh, you know, you said there's 180 days, although I'm not sure if that's for every single school. I know different school districts are in a different, uh, you know, and, and different schools are run differently. And um, But if, on average, it's, let's say it's 180 days and you have, a, you know, this is to be done at the senior class, so it's not spelled out in your bill. It can be, any, any, it can be in the freshman class. Right. In, in your earlier statements, you referenced it was a senior, you know. So <clears throat> uh, if that's the case, fine, but that's not the reality we live in today. As my colleague, Representative Sam Rico, suggested, there's been severe cuts to our public education. Not only that, there's been a severe increase in our standardized testing requirements, and the amount of days that we have to teach in our community, and teachers in specific, uh, has been put under, uh, there, there's great duress put on our teachers, not just the pay cuts, not just the uh, cuts to the, I mean, the increase in class sizes and all this sort of stuff. Um, so in a perfect world, I agree, this would be simple. This is not uh, a perfect world, and this is not a perfect budget. This is not going to be easy. You know, on MPS alone, we're looking at 12 to $23 million in cuts to, to my school district. And I'm sure yours is facing similar uh, uh, stress. So in that context, I don't think it's quite as simple. And that's why in my opening questions, I was asking why you wouldn't talk to these folks who are doing the work on the ground who are actually out there implementing because, I mean, no offense, but since your, your oil days and you're owning your business and all this, a lot could have changed, especially given, for example, class size. You know, you know how many students are in the average MPS class these days? It's grown a lot since I was going there. And how many are in the class now? Well, when I was starting, it was about 33, 34. I think now, you know, I'm not, I'm not positive. I need to double check this, but I think we're looking at 40s. Yes. Uh, and each, it's each class, each class room. Well, this is average, so you can talk about. Yeah. What's that? Somebody show up. i uh, Can I, can I respond to that? No. Okay. Here's your question. So the question is, I, I still think that if if this is something you really care about, and it sounds like it is something you're really passionate about. I would ask if you are willing to take a moment and work with us and work with other people who are interested in education and patriotism to talk to some of the players, talk to some of the people who are actually on the ground doing this work and see if we can make this bill better and see if we can find a way to implement it in a way that's going to work as opposed to kind of forcing another standardized test down the throats of these local uh, school districts. I want to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple more questions. Um, in this bill, um, do you, is there any language, I mean, do, do, do this, does this test have to be given explicitly in English? I would hope so in America. The reason I ask this question, uh, follow-up question, Mr. Um, you know, we have, especially in our more urban districts such as Milwaukee, you know, we do have, number one, a large influx of, of, of immigrant students. And number two, we do have quite a large number of foreign exchange students. Um, so many times foreign exchange students will get their high school diploma through uh, the public school system here. Is it even constitutional to, to force them to take this test? I would think if they, if they came to America and more than likely can speak English, but I'm, I'm, I'm just. I, I mean, we have regulations that we have to, we we have to. Uh, if a guy speaks Spanish and can't speak English, we have to be able to get an interpreter. And I'm, I would assume that there's rules and regulations that would would govern that. Over well, over my horsepower, the little horsepower I have. A fellow Um I guess that kind of why we should be in the education committee um, because this is, I mean, we have, whether you like it or not, whether anybody likes it or not, we have a very large number of immigrant children. In fact, I was just at a school um, last week. We just got a new family in from, um, from uh, actually Iraq. None of the kids spoke English. I mean, how do you address that? So, so uh, that's my statement, but I do have one more question. <laughs> Given the fact that we are now going to be giving, you know, if, if this passes and we give this test in our high schools, and as I stated just a couple of seconds ago, we have many um, families who are immigrants who may not be citizens yet, and it's my understanding that it, it costs roughly $600 to take 
the citizenship test to become a citizen. Is there a way, um, Representative, that we could petition, I don't know, the Lord Council, the federal government uh, to allow this test to count as their actual citizenship test to save that family $600 as long as you give the test, you may as well make some use of it. If you come into America as an, as an immigrant, and I believe if you're under age 16, you are automatically come in with mom and dad. Now, if you're over, over 16, uh, I, that's a decision that I, I mean, I, I don't have enough. I mean, I Wait can't. This is an important issue. I, didn't say I guess I, I don't understand what you're saying about that because my, one of my, my close, very close friends came over here from Scotland when she was 10 years old. She should, she should have come in uh, as, as a naturalized citizen. No, she is not a citizen and she cannot afford to take a citizenship test. So there, we need some clarification there because Sorry, you've got the wrong information, um, Representative. <laughs> So the intent, the intent is, uh, representing we, the intent for, the test is going to be in the junior or senior high school? <coughs> so at some point in four years, they would have to be administered this test. Would you, do you envision this being a, uh, well, first of all, it doesn't sound like it's a big deal. Uh, so are we talking about potentially just giving this test in the history class? Hey, hey, we're in citizenship class or history class or, you know, uh, Okay. You know, and, and if there was, if there was this family she's talking about, if the kid is going to graduate in three weeks from now, or a month from now, whenever, whenever graduation is coming up, and he can't speak English, I would sure hope that someone could interpret that to him so that he can get his, if he's passed the qualifications, to graduate from whatever high school he's going to. I, I would hope that someone there would put out their put their armor on this kid and say here we're going to help you get through this okay i'm not going to ask i'm hoping the aclu is going to testify because they might be able to answer some of those sure. questions representative thank you mr chair um representative edmund i just yeah. i just wanted to um, piggyback off of what representative Sanicki did to ask you about of course this is america i always encourage my constituents um to make sure if they don't know english uh, yeah. that they learn it um that they practice uh, but the truth is, is we do have English, English language learners mm -hmm. and they, these students are in our schools and they're working very hard to learn the English language. And I'm told in your Senate district, you have a thriving mom community. And I do want to ask you if there's language in the bill that explicitly states that the, that, uh, the test could be taken in a language other than English for those, for those English language learners that are absolutely I don't working believe, very hard. I, I don't believe it is, but it would be... Uh, uh, be, a, be a, an excellent amendment. I'm happy to hear that. You're open to amendments. I'm open to amendments. Okay. I will connect with the office. Perfect. Representative Jagler. Thank you, Representative. Um, the, the, a comment more for <clears throat> restraining of the origin of this bill, whether it's an ALEC bill, it's a cost, by the way, the only budget I ever voted for increased funding for education, $150 per pupil in each. Uh, here in the Bayang. Well, we're, we're straying all over it, and, and we don't seem to be talking much about the bill on whether he did his homework. I, I'm just a little dismayed by that. I hope we can get to the actual testimony about the bill itself. I do have some concerns on, on uh, disability issues of students with disabilities on that. I know that's going to be brought up later, but um, I, I, I just, again, to clarify, you've taken the test? Yes. And you did well? I passed it. <laughs> Don't tell us your score. <laughs> well, I passed it. Thank you, sir. I look, I look forward to more testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And actually, uh, Representative Jagler kind of touched on the question I was going to ask. Um, uh, I'm assuming that your understanding is, is that every Wisconsin high school student would have to take this test in order to graduate. Correct. Um, is that including those with cognitive disabilities? <coughs> I guess there'd be, be an amendment on that too. I'm, you know. Okay, thank you. Representative Gannon. Thank you, Chair. Representative Edmund. I'm really confused. I thought there was like a normal process for submitting a bill and spreading it around this building and then having it come to the committee for a hearing. 
Did you do something different? No. So you mean this bill actually went to all the members of this committee and all the members of the assembly in advance? I believe it did. Oh. People were acting like you don't know what you're doing. It sounds like you did it exactly according to the rules. I thought, I thought we did. Okay, thank you. Um, how many members of the education committee called you on this bill? Uh, on the education committee? The, edu the, the highly coveted assembly education committee. As far as I know, I never had any. No, just curious, because they would have received this bill also, correct? I would certainly believe that they did. I'm just making sure I understand how this works around here, because it seems like people are challenging your model of passing legislation. So thank you. <coughs> I, I, I think you're going to agree that. So. Thank you. Representative Brenton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I was also going to mention, did you know that the online tests really were applied for our English as a second language for kids with disabilities? And um, there's some, that might be some options that we're looking for that um, maybe using some of the formats that are online and online right now and as study guides. Um, it's not a perfect solution, but there, I, I think you're, I, there's some room within this bill for all of those options as um, you certainly would have students that would be homeschoolers. Um. Correct. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Representative. I, I, I do um, appreciate you coming here, and, and, uh, and I understand your, your good intent on this. Um, but I do have some concerns, and Representative Jagler touched on it, as did uh, Representative Onstead. Um, when was it last that you were teaching in the classroom? Seventy-one. Okay. He took the test on stump test. It's been a long time. Most of you people weren't even weren't even born yet. <laughs> I wasn't. Um, so uh, the 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 concern, the main concern. I have uh, other concerns. Uh, first being, I don't think this is the right committee for this, but uh, that's not your fault by any means, or the chairman's fault by any means. But the the idea. Uh, which is the Individual Disabilities Educational Act, I don't think was around at that point in time, at least not in the current configuration. And to talk about how we're going to make this a requirement and not address those with um, cognitive disabilities, IEPs, um, which I assume everybody in here knows what an IEP is, even though this isn't the Educational Committee. Is there anybody that doesn't? Okay. Um, that That is a, a significant cost to the public schools. In the public schools, because the voucher schools don't take those kids. They leave them behind for the public schools. So there has to be significant accommodations for these kids as far as testing and, and so forth. And so the comment that this isn't going to take hours to prepare for or take isn't accurate with a significant uh, population of, of the public school uh, children out there. So it will be a significant cost. That's why I think you know, with, with that issue, there needs to be a fiscal note. I don't know how there wouldn't be because I think that's an additional cost that would, uh, without any funding put in this bill, be borne by the public schools. And so that is something I think you need to just look into. I think it's uh, something that there, there is a concern. And also, I know that we, there was a group of bipartisan, a bipartisan group, including Representative Borpagel, that just sent out a letter to uh, folks in DC con with significant concerns about we're just teaching to the test, standardized test, standardized test, standardized test. And I, I don't disagree with what you're saying, that you know, kids should know some of the, you know, these things and so forth. But we, again, are crunching the days uh, so much into these hours each day and then limiting how much they can meet during the school year. And then now we're going to put another test out there. And we, we're going to put additional costs, certainly with a, a certain segment of these kids. Um, I think maybe it would be behooved to, to go back and, and talk to these folks and figure out how to maybe address some of that, if you'd be willing to do that, and it sounds like you are. But to make it, make it go, yeah. make, make it happen. But for me personally, I've got seven school districts in my, in my district, so if I um, propose any educational bills, I call those seven superintendents and we email all the school boards. Did you do any of that with your school districts? No. Okay. Thank you. Be able to pass this test and, and um, move forward to graduation. 
I think you already mentioned this, but at what time of the year, when would the test be taken? It can be taken any time within the four years of high school. Okay. And how much time do you expect to be taken away from classroom instruction for students to take the exam? Well, like the representative said here, that for preparation for it, they can do it online. Um, uh, they, they may not even have to study for it. Uh, uh, um, it's, it's, it's very minimal. I guess that's, that, that, it's not, I guess, that's why I did not go, did not bother to go to the state superintendent of education and all, and all of this because it, it, it is not a huge, 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 Endeavor. So, can I follow up, Mr. Chair? And I, let me just say, Representative Redman, I absolutely want to increase civic engagement, in particular in my district. The reason I ran for office is because I represent the district that ha routinely reports the lowest voter turnout in the state of Wisconsin. I always tell people it was a catalyst for my decision to run for office. I wanted to inspire greater voter turnout, greater civic engagement. And so at first glance, I did, I did your, your bill caught my eye. But the truth is, is that this is not a civics 101. This is not a class. It's just what you said. It's just, it is a test. We don't even know if it's oral or written. Sounds like it's multiple choice. Relies solely on memorization. Is it really the best way to engage students on, a civics, educa on civics education? They're gonna memorize it for the 100 questions, you know, for the whatever time you allot for that day that is reserved for testing. And then there's no, I don't, I don't see any conversation or dialogue around the importance of voting, when elections take place. If I can, if I can hold it in my brain for 50 some years and I never memorized it 50 years ago, I must have one awful good memory or, or of a memorization. I mean, simple questions like, uh, When's the last day you can send your income tax papers in? When is that? April 15th. You know, it, a lot of this, we use it basically every day, but what I'm trying to get away from is jaywalking. You know. So you're arguing that students already know this, let's just make sure. Let's just make sure. <coughs> let's just make sure that they know it. And if, and if they can take the test and pass it, Get 60 of them right, they're, they're done. If, go ahead. The catalyst for the introduction of this bill, you said, is Jay Walking on, on Jay Leno's late night show. I just feel like it's so flip and there's not any real sentiment. I feel like you, you, you don't know, there's, there's not clear instruction on how, the bill, on how it will be implemented in our schools. I, I have real concerns around, around the fact that it, this appears to be a half-baked bill. Well, I appreciate your your calling it half big, but I mean, it's uh, uh, when when I taught school, and and you still have to stand in front of the students just like you did 50 years ago, and and a lot, and, and this stuff is like like the the, the the chairman said, we are we're just reinforcing the fact that they know what you know. Why do they take? Why do you take a test? In, in algebra, it's going to cause undue harm and undue work for the teachers. It's part of their job. This is part of their of their job description is to see that kids know this kind of stuff. And it's just that, as a legislator and as a grandfather and a father and a great grandfather, I want my kids to certain that they know this stuff. Uh, Representative, you also uh, argue that uh, these. Actually, some of these questions, let's say the stars and stripes on the flag, have all, will already be answered uh, in previous chapters of the history book. Absolutely. And so you're just bringing this all together at some point within four years. Correct. Okay. Representative Brostov. Thank you, Chair. And, uh, thanks again. So um, this is kind of a strange day. I just have to say, it's a little bizarre. This is a day where I'm going to agree with more of my Republican colleagues on this committee than I think I have ever before in, in this contest. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank if you. anyone else wants to applaud me, you're welcome. Uh, moving on. Uh, I think uh, Representative Gannon hit it on the head, and I have to say I could not agree more with them. 
I also agree with what Representative Jagler said. I agree with uh, the sentiments of Representative Cleefish and Branchin. Um, and I also agree very much with a letter that represent with the spirit behind letter that Representative uh, Vorpagel uh, sent out. So let me clarify. Um, you have obviously put a lot of time and effort into this bill, and you haven't done anything wrong, as Representative Cannon said. This isn't wrong. In fact, this is exactly how it's supposed to work. We're supposed to be a deliberative body that looks at ideas that are brought forward in committee. We discuss these ideas. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time, and I'm not going to agree. With, you know, I'm not a baker. I don't like baking, but I cook. And sometimes it takes a little more time to cook the legislation, to work on it, to build it up. And like you said, there's, you know, you can do some work talking with some of these you know, school folks, and, and maybe there's some friendlies around uh, issues of, um, you know, folks with uh, different needs and, and that sort of stuff. But, uh, but that's what this building and that's what this body is about. And I just really, first of all, want to thank the chair for, for allowing that to happen. I wish we had more of that. Sometimes, like I said, legislation isn't supposed to take two weeks, especially far-reaching legislation that affects huge segments of our population and puts uh, extra burdens on uh, you know, folks who are trying to do their jobs. Nicely. So I just wanted to point that out. What a rare moment. I, I agree so much with the sentiment that, that we've had so far today. You've done everything right, and this bill will, I think, be done right. It might take a month or two months, but it will be done right and better right than rushed. And uh, I guess my last question is um, for, this, you know, for this segment of it. Uh, if, um, you know, if, if we're going to be reaching out to the school districts, uh, I would just ask that when you talk to MPS, if I can be involved in those conversations, and I have some contacts, and I think groups and Emory, Ben Snicky, and some other Milwaukee folks would like to as well, but I think there are some unique issues that we deal with, especially given the large, I mean, we have a huge Burmese population coming now, and uh, obviously, you know, it's, it's, you know, there's a large amount of Latino and, and uh, um, Hmong, so, uh, Given the unique problems that Milwaukee has, I would just like to be brought in on those conversations. And by doing that research, your staff uh, is working on that. If you could include us in the conversation, I'd appreciate it. Is that okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to follow up on the comment made about education committee members reaching out to you on this bill. No, it was introduced on Monday, and I mean I don't know how other people look at bills, but. I first look at the bills that are coming to committees that I'm on, and I just happened to, you know, be on this committee, and so I was an education bill. So I immediately went to Representative Pope's office, who is the ranking Democrat on, on the education, and she had not seen it because it was in the wrong committee. So if we had a chance, maybe we would have reached out to you to find out what it was about. But given the timeline that this was placed on, we really, honestly, did not have the chance to actually look at the bill and then reach out to you. But um, and then I just had a. a a question on the bill. Um, now you, in the bill, you require private voucher schools to also take the test. If, if, they, if, if the school takes uh, uh, money, if, if if they take state, if they take aid, then they have to. So so it's going to be all the school, you know, pretty. I just want to thank you for that because you know we have actually been trying to make the majority part of you understand that. These private schools are taking taxpayer money and should be subject to the same accountability standards that every public school is part of. So, thank you for, for actually publicly admitting that. Thank you. I have a question for the Legislative Council. Um, is there anything in the bill that says, and I know Representative Branch and keep referencing, you can take this online, the test is ready to go. <clears throat> But is there anything in the bill that says who would be responsible for actually writing the exam, or are they truly just going to lift it from from up, from on, from the internet, as as I've heard be mentioned? And would it be DPI or would it be the individual school district um, taking care of that? The bill doesn't specify um, who would put a specific test together. I think the author is correct that there would be some discretion for an individual school districts and even school um, in determining that. But the questions on the test must be identical to the 100 questions that are, um, from which questions are drawn for the civics exam portion of na the nationalization test. Um, so the questions, in a sense, are already written. Um, but the bill doesn't specify um, whether the questions would be 
whether multiple choice answers would, would be given. I know there are sample tests out there that include multiple choice answers, so it could be that a school would draw from those um, sample tests that are out there. Okay. I have an inquiry of the chair. Sure. Um, Mr. Chair, and you and I spoke yesterday, I called mm -hmm. you around this bill. Mm -hmm. You know that I believe this bill should be in the Education Committee, mm -hmm. a committee that both the Speaker of the Assembly, Representative Robin Box, and our Minority Leader on the, on the Democratic side, Representative Peter Barca, have appointed yeah. legislators with substantial knowledge, experience, and passion around education in this state. And I am very offended that we are taking up this bill when we have a committee devoted to education why is it in our committee? And will you join me in letting Speaker Voss know that this should be, in fact, before the appropriate committee, which is education? Uh, I don't disagree that the bill may or not should be in this committee. Uh, however, as I indicated earlier on, um, I am not offended by as many stars and stripes on the, on the American flag. Um, so, uh, no, I don't join in... Uh, in uh, echoing your sentiments to the speaker's office. Uh, I'm happy to hear this bill and I'm happy to move it forward uh, at such point where we agree on it. Uh, but thank you for the inquiry. Okay. So Representative Edming, could it be as simple as taking the same online test? I, I see no reason why it couldn't. So in, I mean, Hypothetically, in four years, could these students get online, take the 100-question test, and submit the result, and be case closed? I would think so, as long as, long as it is. And the teacher may want to say, really, huh? what are them 50 stars on that flag for? Mm -hmm. Gee. You know, as long as the kid can answer, that's all it's got to be. You know? it, it's, it's not rocket science. Right. Any other questions of the author? Uh, I just got one more. Representative Brasta. I also say I, I agree with the patriotic kind of zeal that this is being introduced with and, and the general idea of you know love for the country and all that stuff. Um, and I think one of the ideas of, of us, you know, uh, I think one of the best ways to express it is a strong American educational uh, body, you know, and, and I want to know if there's going to be other amendments like this coming out that are going to work to strengthen, for example, our math scores, our reading scores, and our science scores, given that I think uh, it's, it's most patriotic to have a competitive America, and right now we're falling way behind, uh, and this, again, it's, it's not in place, of, but it is time that could be given towards those. So are we also going to work on boosting time for math, for uh, science, for the other things that will make us competitive with India, China, other educational uh, uh, competitors that are doing great things? This could be more of a cutting edge than what we really think to begin with. As it as it as it progresses on, as legislators, we can do that. Okay. Any other questions of the author? With that, Mr. thank you very much for your time. Thank you for the bill. Thank you, and, and thanks to the committee. Next up, uh, speaking against is the Pettick from BPI. <coughs> Tight quarters. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. I managed to dodge the rain. It looks like it's actually sunny out now yeah. this afternoon. So thank you for having me, committee. As the representative said, my name is Dee Pedock. He did an excellent job pronouncing it. No one ever gets that right. I'm the legislative liaison for the Department of Public Instruction. Um, it sounds like we're having, you know, cut, this is not my normal forum. Normally I am in front of the education committee. So maybe I can help as we go through this kind of talk about how the assessment process also works in the state of Wisconsin, how we generally procure and deploy these models. Um, and I'll, I'll go over a lot of my points have already been touched on by various committee members, but humor me for a moment as I read through my testimony and I'll try to make it as brief as possible. So under current law, um, Wisconsin has no single test that's used as a graduation requirement. The state also does not mandate any graduation requirements for private schools. Moving in this direction should be approached with caution and anything crafted must, be, must uh, have a research base and take into consideration our most vulnerable students. The Department of Public Instruction has the following concerns about creating such a high stakes test as a requirement for a high school diploma or for a high school equivalency diploma. 
Um, the bill contains no exceptions, as we've discussed, for special education students who take alternative exams. It contains no exceptions for students who are new to the country, are here on a visa, or may have limited English skills. The bill does not provide any additional funding for school districts to account for additional materials, professional developments, or professional development needed to prepare students for this exam. And most importantly, I think from the DPI's perspective, the bill doesn't clarify who, how, or what format this test should be deployed in. Generally speaking, um, when it comes to state and federally required assessments, the state procures the test and provides it to school districts. I understand there's online modules, but I think if we're talking about a graduation requirement, continuity across the state in what tests, what format the tests is taken in should probably be considered. There's a big difference between multiple choice, fill in the blank, if it's offered in paper pencil, if it's offered online. We also have a, you know, a lot of rural schools where online access is sometimes an issue. We just experienced that as we move to a new online examination. So I think those are all things you should take into consideration when possibly tightening this draft of the bill. Um, if the department were to procure tests, or I mean, there's certain things the department would be responsible in terms of, you know, we have a school for the blind in Wisconsin. This test needs to be translated into Braille. That's expensive. That's why I'm a little confused about why no fiscal estimate was requested of DOA, because that would be a state expense. If we have to translate a test into Braille, it takes a considerable amount of time and also has a considerable amount of cost. But again, those are students that, you know, we hope to have a, receive a diploma someday, and if this test would be a barrier for that or not having it available, in a format in which they can access it. That's a real concern for us. Um, so some of those details are lacking in the bill. Generally, when we talk about assessments, it's sort of laid out how the test is offered, when the testing window will be, what year it's supposed to be taken in so that we can create sort of apples to apples comparison across the state and it's uniform because not all students start and finish school in the same school district. So if you're only receiving instruction on this maybe in your sophomore year in school district A, but then you move to school district B and they've maybe already passed it or the exam you know has been given, you might have to go back. It could cause some confusion. So you know, continuity across our 424 school districts is important. Um, lots of moving pieces going on. I know you're gonna hear from some folks later from um, the disability Rights Co so Survival Coalition um, to talk about some of the special um, needs some of our students have in completing assessments. And um, not everyone takes tests the same way. And we need, to, like I said, we need to really protect our most vulnerable students when we start talking about adding a barrier to graduation. And just so you all know, this, this would be a significant change in how we award diplomas. We don't have any one single test right now that would prohibit someone from receiving a diploma. And while you can take it as many times, I think a valid concern would be students who are already struggling to graduate may not return and finish that. I mean, we do have students who are on the brink who we really are trying to help get across that finish line, including in our regular high schools or trying to receive um, an equivalence C diploma. And so this, we wouldn't want to discourage them and some of them might not be come back. I mean, that's, that's just the facts of the matter is that they're already kind of struggling just to try to graduate and then you add another barrier for them and it could be that they understand the content perfectly well but maybe their English literacy isn't proficient and so you need to um, you know, account for that. Um, we have a very you know, fl transit population. We have people who come in from all different countries Recently, I just helped someone who's going to be working at Manpower relocate from England and navigate the open enrollment system. And that woman's daughter was a senior, so that this could cause some significant problems if the test had already been offered or it wasn't available to her. Um, but generally, we just don't go online and download tests. There's ways to procure it within the school district and to ensure that the tests are being offered fairly, the questions are being asked in a clear manner and that everyone's taking it in the same similar type of format, multiple choice, fill in the blank, or even you know, oral is an option. So I'm happy, I think there are probably gonna be a lot of questions, so I'm just gonna stop there because I think I just laid a lot out for you and, and there'll be more people to talk. It's just, uh, there's a lot of intricacies when it comes to the education world and K-12, and like I said, we have you know, 424 different school districts that you know, range in size, population, and technical capabilities. So deploying any type of large-scale testing model takes some time and consideration from all ends. Um, 
So I'm happy, happy to answer any questions and certainly to continue to work with members and the author to help tie sure. up some loose ends. So for clarification, you indicated there is no test currently that, that prohibits a child from graduating high school? We have no single graduation test. Our uh, diplomas are based on, our graduation requirements are based on credits achieved through coursework. Okay. So I mean, you could fail a class, I guess, but this would be an actual graduation exam. It's the only test we have that students in our high schools would have to take in order to receive a diploma. We have, I could send you some graduation requirements that are listed on our website, but generally um, it's 12.5 credits in various courses and Ledge Council could probably speak more knowledgeably off the top of her head to exactly what those are because I see her nodding at me. Okay. Um, so hypothetically, is it a big deal for DPI to use the exact same 100 question test that the federal government has online? I mean, creating a test is not necessarily easy, especially if you're going to- say you had a grade three test. Use the exact same test. Okay, when I talk about creating, I also talk about deploying it. So you have to deploy it to all of the students taking so long. Well, I think there's more of an explanation that's needed on this. About testing educators, feelings about testing. <coughs> I mean, it, it really adds a complicated component to that dialogue that's already sort of developing, I think. I think Representative Jay was looking at me like, we could probably tell you that in the education committee, we spend a significant amount of time talking about assessments. I have a, an informational briefing in the Senate tomorrow, actually just for that sole purpose of talking about how we procure and deploy assessments across the state. Okay. Representative Gannon. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for coming. Of course. Um, I get confused maybe because I'm not on the education committee. <laughs> I can't believe that I'm listening that passing a civics course is a barrier to graduation. And I'm thinking in out loud to the question here because don't you have to pass a science course? Don't you have to pass an English course? Uh, I thought you had to have so many credits of English and science tests. My question is, is if a diploma has any value, and that could be a piece of paper. Shouldn't it have some knowledge base to gaining that piece of paper? So you're telling me there's no testing to be a diploma, but I find it hard to believe it, and maybe our education committee is not doing a very good job. But if there's no requirements that our students have to know something to get the heck out of a high school, why don't we just shut her down? I would argue, especially during Teacher Appreciation Week, that our educators are doing an exceptional job across the state of Wisconsin. We're number two in the nation in ACTs. We do have credits for graduation. They're okay. coursework credits. There's 12.5. They're listed very clearly on our website. Those courses probably have exams at the district level that are administered to gain those credits. We do not have one statewide mandated assessment that prohibits anyone from graduation. So, follow up, Chairman. So I could teach science at the simplest level and call that good enough to give my students a diploma in any public school. There are no standards by DPI 
for those schools and what level of science, what level of English is required to graduate. You're telling me that there's no requirements for course or for required curriculum? Well, our state does not mandate curriculum in the school districts. I think that's been covered at nauseum um, in the past two sessions in the legislature. Um, we, we do mandate, I would say, I can give you the statute, which is right here. Um, and they meet with our state standards and students have to complete coursework and testing that's controlled by the local school boards and the districts to make well, up their mind. Mr. Chairman, let me read this. Well, and behold, there are standards. I think I indicated it. statute PI 18.03, Wisconsin. I'm speaking to Mr. Chairman. I think if you interrupted it actually several times, I think I stated that there were standards all along. I don't think I ever said there were no credits yeah. required. If you could confirm that, Mr. Council. Thank you. Okay, so, so, Mr. Chair, I'm going to follow up. With the yeah, I'm just, I'm just. Actually, Representative Gatter, the rest of us would love to have you as a science teacher. Well, you would learn something. I would hold you accountable before. In order to get a diploma, we have no standards in this state. So when we ask them to know 60 questions about the history of their country and the U.S. Constitution, we're holding children back. I got news for you. That, that's not going to harm a kid going into the rest of their life to know this man. So why can't we just make another? Let's make the question this. So you were shifts to access the computer right. labs but um but i would say schools are moving you know in that direction and doing their best to make it work um what about um as far as like staff in service time to teach how to test this is there is that going to be an issue i think the schools and the uh, Education Association can better talk, they're here okay. to speak, but can speak to the professional development that's generally provided towards educators when administering any type of exam, just sort of. That's possible to the district. It, yes, it, it could be a cost to the district, yeah. Um, I had another question. I, oh, yeah. So we, when Representative Gannon was talking about standard, they're available on, your, on, the, on the EPA website. Yes, our, our graduation requirements are available right. on our website, and there was recently a bill passed last year that increased the number of math and science credits required, so that was the most recent action, which has been updated on our website. So we can all take a look at that, mm -hmm. and I mean, because I know we've been, um, not only in the state of Wisconsin, but across the nation having some very vigorous uh, discussions about, for instance, Common Core, which I don't want to get into in this committee. Thanks. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I me, appreciate I mean, that. Those are standards, and those are, yes, those are our standards. And unfortunately, you know, we got members of this body that are going to repeal those standards and start all over. So we do have standards right now. We have ongoing conversations on lots of educational issues right now. I know. 
And that's the best way I can put it. Representative Zamipa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I really feel compelled to clarify for the committee um, and for the public that this is not a civics course, correct? Yes. Correct, we are not, this bill does not address a course. This is a, about a citizenship test, 100 questions that will be imposed on our students in Wisconsin, correct? You're correct, this doesn't mandate a course or specific curriculum related to civics education, it's just the examination. So Mr. Chair, I just want to clarify because Representative Gannon repeatedly referenced this as a civics course. This is not a class, there won't be any dialogue with the students. It's a 100 question test that will be imposed on our students here in Wisconsin, a high stakes mandated exam that they'll have to pass in order to get their diploma. I, I would love to talk to Representative Gannon about the idea of a civics course to talk to our students in dialogue about the importance of civic engagement, but only after the Republican majority restore the, his, the historic cut. have kind of in different ways is often covered in someone's IEP. So some students are offered it orally, offered more time, offered to take it in a private room. There's lots of different you know, um, accommodations that are made for students who have an IEP plan. Uh, I think flexibility is good, but you also don't want a, a patchwork of way things work or you, know, you might want the same test exactly that. So we know all students are meeting the same graduation requirement and the, the test is given in the same way I, I would think would make the most sense but again we would you know look for accommodations to be made for English learners obviously translation for Braille and and then um, and, for special needs and I students. shudder at the thought of even saying this but is that something that could maybe be accomplished by through rule making uh, at EPI or you really want to go there? Well, like I said, I never thought those words would ever come out of my mouth. But wow, here we are. You're kind of putting me on the side. Generally, um, generally we don't we procure our tests from other vendors. Um, I guess you could put it in a rule, or you could use some model language that was used when they did the. I think it was last year in the budget. Um, the ACT Aspire Suite was enacted for ninth, tenth, and eleventh graders, and there's probably some model language that relates to the accommodations and exceptions made. But that that might be a good starting place because that I, that was the most recent um, addition to state mandated testing that we did was last year. Thank you. Any other questions for D from DPI? Seeing none, thank you very much. Oh, I was gonna say I like your bow tie represent. <laughs> Scott, very you know, silent today. <laughs> well, you know, you got practice makes perfect, I guess. <laughs> we were teasing him earlier. Uh, we're gonna
going to ask, actually, before we have the next uh, person testifying, uh, Representative Culp and Representative Rip need to weigh in on uh, the two votes. Uh, stay here. Oh, do you want him to stay here, or do you need him over there? It's going to be published. It's going to be published anyway. Just say aye. i got to get one of those that spins. I'd like to be recorded. I'd like to be recorded. I'd like to be the chair. <laughs> Next up, then, we will have Sam to. Stone from the Civics Education Initiative. For or against this? And this was uh, speaking in favor. Oh. Welcome, Sam. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming to testify today. I appreciate the invitation. Uh, my name is Sam Stone. I'm the Executive Director for the Civics Education Initiative. Uh, and this, the idea behind this legislation came from our organization. We're affiliated with the Joe Foss Institute in Phoenix, Arizona, which is a very, very small organization dedicated to uh, promoting civics education and helping close the civics gap in America. Uh, and so when this idea was brought forward, we have a number of programs that have been operated for a few decades since the institute was founded. And our board asked a question last year, are we really shaking the tree? Are we really making a difference? And the answer was, well, we're making a difference for those small number of kids we touch. But there's an awful lot of other kids out there that need this knowledge and need to have an understanding of what it means to be a citizen, who we are, where we come from. Uh, because we, frankly, have a, an incredibly dangerous form of government for uninformed citizens. Uh, and so uh, some of the testimony that I brought will be passed around today, and I'm not going to touch on, on all of it because uh, some of you have mentioned it, but the, the impetus behind this is in the never-ending string of bad numbers about civics education nationwide. And, you know, the most recent national assessment of educational progress showed less than a quarter, less than a quarter of our kids are proficient in civics. Uh, Fusion did a massive millennial poll uh, just recently. 77% of people between 18 and 34 can't name one U.S. senator. Uh, you know, the Annenberg Foundation, uh, that number was already brought up, but two-thirds of our citizens can't name all three branches of the federal government. Uh, you know, it, as many representatives have said, this is critical knowledge for people to have to be able to engage in the process of government and to be able to take control of their futures. These are the next leaders. These are the people that we are counting on to take over for all of us in this room. Uh, and unfortunately, American students are becoming increasingly disconnected from our civic life and from that knowledge. And so when we see all sorts of studies out there that show a clear link between having basic, basic civics knowledge and participation, then I think it becomes incredibly critical that we make sure that kids have this. And a lot of the impetus behind this, I, you know, I've gone around the country, we've had six states pass some variation of this bill. Uh, we're not affiliated with any other organization uh, or, 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 or group. Um, but we've worked with states to help craft legislation in each state that fits your needs. And, and each state has come and said, this is what we want to do and, and how can we improve it? And we've done our best to help there. But we need to make sure our kids know at least as much about this country as someone who is a new immigrant who wants to become a citizen does. We have to make sure that they're in a position to take responsibility for their future. And like I said, so far six other states have passed this legislation. Uh, and, and we've had media outlets literally from Bloomberg to the Boston Globe editorial come out in favor of, of this effort. Uh, and in favor of seeing more every state pass uh, legislation along these lines. And obviously, the Boston Globe is not a bastion of conservatism. Um, so this is something that I think, uh, you know, for instance, when we did internal polling, 78% of people support this idea. And it was by two to one in every single demographic. Uh, and so the, the thing I've found is talking to teachers and, and superintendents across the country, I have never met a teacher yet, a civics, a high school a government or history teacher or superintendent who will say, no, we don't teach that. I, 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 I truly believe that 80% of the material in this exam is taught in every school in America. But the problem is we don't put an emphasis on it. We don't create 
the focus on why it's so important for these kids to learn this stuff. And so they come out and it just goes in one ear and out the other. And there's no focus. We've really created an overriding focus on STEM, which is, is critical for international competition. But in terms of our own country, don't like our focus on STEM. We've created an overriding focus in our schools on STEM. And that's really pushed aside some of the other well-rounded curriculum that we need, including this. And I would say we are happy to help uh, at the, the Civics Education Initiative to work with, uh, with all of you here on, on crafting legislation that meets your specific needs. Uh, and I can address many of the questions that have been brought up. Uh, in most other states, uh, states have either exempted uh, students with an existing IEP from the requirement entirely, or they've required them to take the test but not have it be a graduation requirement. So they're exposed to the materials regardless, uh, but don't have the, the graduation requirement attached to it. And, and that's answered that question. And, and for ELLs, uh, obviously I'm from Arizona. We have, a, a, uh, in many of our school districts, even close to a majority of our students are, are ELL. So uh, we, we looked at this, and Arizona was the first state to pass legislation along these lines. Uh, there's a couple of ways you can go about it here if you choose to amend this legislation. Uh, you can amend it along the same lines as students on an IEP. Uh, but I think, it's, I think it's critically important for anyone in this country to get this material. So I think the other thing is that this is available in 72 languages online. Uh, so there are plenty of opportunities to, to uh, have that test pre-created. Um, the cost, of, you know, in terms of the cost of the test, we've had uh, the largest fiscal note that's been attached to this has been fifteen thousand uh, dollars in any state, and that was uh, the only one state that added a fiscal note for it, and that was for modification of their computer system. So, uh, we at the Joe Foss Institute have commissioned the creation of an online testing portal that will be available. Uh, it's actually gonna go up this summer for kind of beta testing and public testing. Uh, and then will be available starting next school year for schools and districts to use and access for free uh, if they want to. And that can be modified for your state requirements in terms of your firewalls, your learning management systems, the, the computer systems behind your software, uh, and for privacy and reporting requirements. So that's, that is available there as well. And that also will have alternative uh, language options, initially Spanish, but if there's a great demand, we will look to add additional options there as well. Um, and as an example of, of how useful this can be, uh, there's a system of 15 inner city, mostly they're, they're actually in Harlem, uh, schools in New York City, uh, Democracy Prep that uses this, and, and they're a very, very unusual charter because they do, uh, for those of you in the education community, they backfill all their classes right through senior year uh, in, in a number of things. But they've given this test to their students in both the fourth and twelfth grades since their start, and they require an 83% rate to pass. They've had a 100% pass rate. And their students have gone on and, and, and really engage in their communities. It's the big focus of those schools is actually civic engagement. And the nice thing about this, and, and as Seth Andrew, the, the former president of Democracy Prep, told me, the questions on the USCIS test were only put together after, as with anything the federal government does, years and years of research and study and committees going over them. All of those 100 questions were designed to form the foundation of knowledge someone would need to begin growing and understanding our civic life and our government across the country. So from the question about Martin Luther King, you can begin to understand and learn about the civil rights movement, uh, Susan B. Anthony, the women's rights movement, and on and on. So this is a foundation, and as we've said from the start, we think it's critically important that states not stop here, start here. This is the floor, but let's keep building towards that ceiling. Let's really improve civic education across the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. So just, um, you touched on um, $15,000 was one state's cost? Yes. For a computer yes. upgrade? Yes, sir. Okay. And then in other states, they just exempt some of the students that are not yeah, if, if uh, students on an existing IEP, so far in the six states that passed it, two have completely exempted students with IEPs from the, from the test. 
Uh, the other four have all modified it to allow students to take the test but not have it be a graduation requirement. Uh, which, so they're exposed to the material uh, and, and then don't have to worry about it in terms of their diploma. So would you agree then that uh, you know, the material within this civics test obviously should already have been taught and, and, and probably gone over at least? Not only do I agree with you, but I've spoken to literally hundreds of educators across the country and every one of them has said the same thing, absolutely, we're teaching this material. Uh, but there isn't an emphasis on it. And that's, that's what we're trying to create here, is an emphasis on why this is so important for students. And you know, my thought is, as long as this is taught in class, it doesn't take long to show proficiency. It doesn't take long to show that you've learned that knowledge. And some states have used different formats. For instance, Utah, uh, because they want to be able to give the test in a single class period, a standard 50-minute class period, they decided to do a random sampling of 50 questions, pencil and paper test, random sampling, 50 of the 100, and they can then give it in a single class period. So those are, those are considerations that, that uh, you may want to make, but uh, you know, other, all the other states have gone with the 100 question test. It's really just a matter of what fits all of you here in Wisconsin. So in your experience, has there been a huge hurdle in any of these states implementing? No. No, and, and granted, implementation is, is just beginning, essentially. We started this, uh, came out with this about a year ago and started working on it in Arizona. And um, all the school districts are implementing it beginning next year, but from what we've heard, uh, it's not really m much difficulty in Arizona. The reporting requirement of it uh, can be made fairly complicated if, a, if a, a State Department of Education wants to make it complicated, but it can also be incredibly simple. Uh, for instance, it, in Arizona, the class, the test is designed given in, in class. The teacher certifies, checks off a little box. The student has passed it, and that knowledge, that information is passed up to the State Department. Once that box is checked off, the students are, the requirement is complete. And see, that is just my impression of the intent of the author that the yes. test may be administered during the history class. Absolutely. Uh, is it unusual to have uh, this test tied to a graduation? No, every state so far has tied it to a graduation requirement. Uh, but again, I, I keep hearing the word high stakes test. Well, uh, I'm not much of a gambler, but I gotta say, if, if this is high stakes, then kids are playing with house money because they can go back and retake it. And, and they can take it as many times as they need to pass. And the threshold, uh, if you're looking, you know, uh, two states have gone with a 70% passing threshold, they actually increased it over what the federal government requires. But in my view is answering six, 60 percent of questions of this incredibly basic facts, uh, everybody ought to be able to do, uh, without question. Everybody ought to be able to do that and do it efficiently. And uh, actually, just to touch on another point, I, know it was, I think the author brought it out, but so the student is able to retake the test until he or she passes. That's correct. <coughs> is that correct within this bill? Representative Gannon. Well, thank you. I just got you. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I want to make sure there's clarification. I fully understand the bill. I actually even read the bill when it was passed around for sponsors to both uh, Republicans and Democrats in the Assembly, so I assume those that claim they did not see this bill didn't open all their emails. I know this is not a civics class requirement, but I tend to think like this gentleman is saying, and as you said, Mr. Chairman, you will probably taught in a civics class, so it won't be a large burden. I have a couple questions. We have a large influx of immigrants into this country, both legal and illegal. From your research and your work on this subject, do you believe this would help the assimilation for somebody coming, somebody coming into this country? A absolutely, absolutely it would. Uh, and not to mention which, that everyone who wants to become a legal citizen at some point will be required to take this test verbally in a short answer format from the federal government. So tr uh, developing that knowledge ahead of time will absolutely save them time and make that process easier and help them with the assimilation process, undoubtedly. Thank you. I just have another question. Uh, there's been so much pushback on this. I'm just, I'm concerned a little bit. How many children have been harmed by learning? 
I, you have been empowered by learning? Yeah, a bit hard. Oh, no. Because it sounds to me like you know, no, pushback. And all no. these children, they're going to be sitting here at the steps of the, of the school, they can't get out of there. No, no. Uh, that's not happening? No. We, we don't have them lined up outside high schools in Arizona? We, we haven't had any of those problems. It, it's, you know, it is very hot in Arizona, so lining kids up outside, not good. It's hot here right now. <laughs> <laughs> Can, sure. Uh, Representative Jacob. Actually, it was asked and answered on the what other senior states are doing with the IEPs. Representative Zambrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I looked at your slip, I, and I didn't see where. Where do you reside, sir? Hey, Arizona. So you're from Phoenix as well? Phoenix, yes. Arizona? Yep. Um, and do you hail from Wisconsin? No, actually, I was admiring your city last night. This is my first ever visit to Wisconsin. Uh, so I am, I am the national executive director for the Civics Education Initiative. My job is to work with legislators such as yourselves who are interested in this bill and helping craft it uh, for your state house. Okay, so if, I can, if we could just fill in that you, you're an out-of-state supporter, I'll just fill in that you're from Phoenix, Arizona. Certainly, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Representative Snicky. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Actually, Representative Enrico did ask one of my questions, and welcome to Wisconsin. So, did you contact the, the, the sponsor of the bill? No. We were looking to, to uh, introduce this legislation here in Wisconsin likely later in the year. Um, but the sponsor <coughs> saw the efforts ongoing in other states, and the most recent one was Tennessee, uh, which just passed and decided to move forward on it without directly actually contacting us first. So uh, and we've seen that Tennessee also did the same thing and then we worked with them. Uh, other states we work with uh, very, right from the start. It just depends. Can I ask how your, how, um, what is it, the Joel Foss Institute? Yes, ma'am. Where did you get your funding? Uh, our funding is primarily, actually we, we hold one giant event each year in Phoenix, our annual gala event. Uh, which we raise, uh, we're, we're, it sounds like a lot, we raise about a million and a half bucks that night. Our expenses are pretty small. Uh, there are seven people in our office total and that's our funding for the year basically. We are not a, a high powered organization by any means. Our members uh, simply felt this was important. We put it out there and other in states and legislators, uh, news media across the country really decided this was something that was valuable and began promoting it. And so I've, I've personally been sort of running to keep up uh, with the legislation. Um, Can I ask one more quick question? You bet. Um, might be two, I don't know. Um, so I think it's kind of obvious. I don't think anybody in this room opposes our kids, you know, having civics and knowing how their government works and, you know, understand the country. I don't think there's any objection in this room to that. <coughs> The objection I have is using this as a high stakes graduation test. Would you still support, you know, I mean, making sure teachers are teaching this stuff without having a test for graduation? Well, from our point of view, the one thing we've seen is every, again, every teacher, every school district I've spoken to, they say this is being taught. The problem is that when people are asked these questions, they don't know the answers. And, and you know, when you have half the, actually quite a bit more than half the country, about 75% of the country can't name the vice president, you're missing some pretty critical knowledge. And so the reason for the requirement is simply to create the same focus uh, that they did at democracy prep in terms of making it important for, frankly, for the adults. When the adults know it's important, they're going to translate that to the kids. The kids are going to understand the importance of it. And, and it's going to filter in a lot more. And so that's why uh, we looked at, when we did this in Arizona and other states, we, we did it, uh, promote it as a requirement. And I think that's the best way to go about it. But from our perspective, we're here to support your efforts in improving civics education, not just with this, but with overall uh, improvement in civics education. That's our mission, uh, our mission of the Institute and our foundation. So right now we're, we're working on this. Let's set the floor. This is the floor. But let's make sure the floor is in place. The kids have that basic, basic knowledge that they need. And then they can start learning and growing off of it. One more quick one. Now what is your, are you an educator by background or what's your background? I, I've been a, a political education specialist for a number of years. Are you a teacher? No, ma'am. No, so I you don't have a degree in teaching? No, ma'am. Oh. Thank you very much. 
And thank you very much. Uh, I had one quick clarifying question. Uh, you're a political educator, obviously very well compensated, and you do you know fly over the country I, to do this sort of work. Better I think we all I think we all do. Uh, but uh, I, I I can tell that you know you're very good at what you do. You're you're offering political education or whatever your your job is. So I didn't want to interrupt you when you spoke, but I wanted you to clarify exactly the comments you made to me directly during your opening testimony and what you're talking about with STEM cell or with uh, STEM education. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I was talking about, nationwide, we've had a huge focus, really across the country, on STEM. Uh, science, technology, it's uh, started out as engineering and math in most schools, and most school states have gone to talking about science, technology, English, and math. Um, and there's been an overriding focus on those subjects in our school systems. And I think that is really, from what we've seen, in fact, the numbers show, that that has really hurt student knowledge in other areas. And I, I do think that while those are critically important, that a well-rounded education is more important. Okay, so you're, so you're saying that you're opposed to furthering the STEM education, and in place of that, you'd like to push these tests on schools. No, I'm, I'm opposed to education <coughs> that is too narrowly focused on any and by one. Near, gotcha, and just to clarify, by narrowly focused, you mean uh, education is focused around science, technology, uh, engineering mathematics. Only in terms of having those as essentially standalone focuses. I, I believe those are important. I think we should continue to promote those. But we're doing too much. We need more time for these tests that you're pushing. I think we need more time for learning of civic knowledge and for a broad range of other subjects. Yes. And one last follow up, which is if we start to do what you say and have less than emphasis, even though we're 52nd in the world on STEM and declining. We're not being competitive with the rest of the world, and we're not being, I think, very patriotic when we let our uh, children not be competitive with the rest of the world in that. Uh, so you're saying we should continue that path, be less competitive in STEM, and put more of an emphasis towards these tests that you're paid to well, go around the country to I run. imagine you and I have different ideas about how to improve STEM education in this country. You mentioned some of the Asian countries. Uh, I, I know of no school district in this country that would employ the educational methods they require of their students. Um, so. I, I, excuse me, just to clarify, I did not say that I said we're 50 seconds in the world right. and we're on the decline. No, but previously you had mentioned some of those, those other countries as comparisons. Um, we're 50 seconds in the world, that's the fact. Oh, worse than that in some subjects. And you want us to continue going down that path? So Abs we can... Absolutely not. I'd like to see us improve education across the board. Okay, I, I simply feel that in yeah. a country... We're good. Thank you. Gotcha. In a country... Well, I'm going to channel the spirit of Fred Kessler, if I may. <laughs> uh -oh. How much time do we have? Um, as the son of uh, two public school teachers, and currently uh, a substitute teacher in the Lake Country Public Schools, I understand, as teachers do, that when you add something, you take away something. You can only put a certain amount of uh, refuse in by a pound of bag. So I get that. What's been frustrating to me today, and I, and I certainly don't think all the members are guilty of it, what has been frustrating to some extent is the politicization, politicization that's been brought into this world. You know, we've got a freshman who, who brings a bill in what I believe is good faith. And we have the Department of Public Instruction, which gives us its issues with the bill, which in a very simple amendment can all be addressed. You know, the, the jabs aren't necessary. And frankly, I've seen this committee and its members work across the aisles very well. Um, I think Representative Brostoff made some comments earlier about his potential sincerity to support something like this. So having gone round and round on all of the political phantoms we could pull out of the attic, and I'm not blaming one side or the other, I think the simple answer is, if the bill's not quite ready for prime time, okay. in good faith, as our children deserve, we will address some of the things DPI brought up. And, and this gentleman, like him, lump him, makes more than us, doesn't make as much as us, whatever. 
jet sets around? <laughs> He's got some easy answers to some of the questions that were asked. So, in addressing some of the concerns on the other side, I would hope that if we do act in good faith and answer those questions and come back with a bill that is feasible and very, very clearly, nobody, uh, including the author, who may not have thought of it at the beginning, would, would insist that somebody who has, is vision impaired take a test they can't see, or if there are cognitive disabilities that we don't have allowances for that. But let's not get away from the fundamental basis of education. And, and the author brought up Jay Leno, and then there was a jab about this being the Jay Leno bill. The reality of it is, we're proud of our teachers. We're proud of the heritage we have in Wisconsin for education. I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever that if we figure out a way to answer all the DPI's questions, this can be something that can be afforded to the schools across the board. And maybe when those kids are asked 10, 15 years from now, they'll have a basic civics knowledge they wouldn't have come out of school with. So I guess my question to this gentleman who clearly flew here from Arizona and doesn't live here, okay, <laughs> is whether he'd be willing, when he goes back to Arizona, to correspond with the author and some of us who may be writing amendments. And we will work, and you have my word, We'll work across uh, across the aisle and hopefully get the other side to a point that they'd be considering willing uh, to even support the bill with some of their amendments, which is your hope that it's give and take. Um, and so would you be willing to do that? That's my question. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would. And so far in the six states that have passed this, this has been a bipartisan bill in every state. We've had uh, significant support, majority support on both sides of the aisle. Um, with the exception of Utah, where it's hard to call majority support the, the eight Democrats in the House there. But, um, you know, I mean, we really have had great support. In Arizona, for instance, Senator Dennis DeConsini, a former Democratic senator, uh, U.S. Senator, and Senator John Kyle, our former Republican senator, uh, stepped up as, as co-chairs of this effort together uh, because they thought it was so important. Uh, we have in South Carolina former uh, uh, U.S. Secretary of Education under Bill Clinton, Richard W. Riley, who is a co-chair of the effort there. Uh, so we've had support on both sides of the aisle, and we are absolutely eager to work uh, with all of you to do that. I appreciate that, and I would, you know, say to Brosty over there, maybe we could talk about the possibility of an amendment and working together. On it. What happened to that in here? Yeah, what happened? Brosty, Brosty, chicken off. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. You bet. Uh, I'm glad to hear there was bipartisan support as well. Representative Jagler. I'm sure you'd be happy to work with us if that means you can just set it back to Wisconsin. Ha, ha. Um, maybe in December. Maybe in December. <laughs> I, I, I gotta say, airline travel these days is not so pleasant that I look forward to it, but I'm happy to come and help. This is such a great state, though. At the risk of causing those on the other side of the table's head to explode, I, there is one point I, I do need to mention, and I, and I want to ask here on, on other, other states. I truly think this is impossible to do, it's illegal to do, to uh, apply this to, to private schools. I think you, you can't do that. You can't, I, that's, I, I'm obviously not an attorney, but I'm wondering what other states uh, have that situation where you, if there's choice in other states or, or a requirement to, to force something, uh, a requirement for graduation on a private school. Uh, actually, that has not been a uniform decision by the states, and partially I think that's based on their state constitutions um, for those decisions. Some states do require that all schools receiving state money follow the exact same requirements, and in those cases they did. Uh, in other cases they didn't. So really that, that is... Um, so there are some states where it does apply to private schools? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. I thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from the committee for Mr. Stone? With that, Mr. Stone, I will tell you that I found your testimony very, very helpful. Thank you and very much. Thank you Mr. very Mr. much Chair. for coming. Thank you. Next up, uh, speaking against, Jerry Feeney from the Wisconsin Rural Schools Alliance.
Mr. Feeney, have we met? Thank you very much. <laughs> Chairman Torgen and uh, members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to uh, talk to you today about what we feel is the impact of AB 94 on rural school districts. Uh, I'm, I'm Jerry Feeney, the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Rural Schools Alliance, and we represent uh, administrators and school boards and teachers and community members from uh, rural schools and communities across the state. I will tell you that we fully support the importance of instruction in American government and civics as a component of high school curriculum leading to graduation, absolutely. In fact, right now, three credits of social studies are required in or by state statutes in order for uh, students to graduate from high school. And certainly, government and civics are components of those courses. Uh, I will tell you, and, and I'd be anxious to be able to see something specific, but I have not seen any evidence for Wisconsin students that would illustrate that our graduates are lacking in this knowledge. Even the NAEP test is not talking about high school seniors. So I haven't seen any evidence that there is a lack of this knowledge from our graduates. We are very concerned about creating a high stakes test that could have unintended consequences for students with text testing anxiety. That they would simply drop out of school instead of retaking a failed test. Research has clearly demonstrated a link between high stakes testing and dropout rates. In addition, there, and this has already been talked about, but there's no provision for special education students to receive special accommodations. And I think we have to keep in mind that in rural schools across our state, we have seen a significant increase in poverty, and we are serving an increased number of special education students and English language learners. So this legislation would place a significant burden on schools as they work to meet the needs of these populations of students. In fact, more than 50% of our rural schools, uh, uh, more, more than 50% uh, of our rural schools currently have over 60% poverty. And the special education rate is 15 plus percent of the students. So it's a significant number of students that we're talking about here. This legislation would place a significant burden on, on, on our uh, schools as they deal with these students. This is a substantial test, and that's why I asked the question, because I think we need to follow through a, with a little bit more on this, but this is a substantial test, the one that is referenced in the legislation, because it is a test that requires short answer uh, responses. And this would be very difficult to do with students with any kind of disability, uh, without special accommodations. It also is 100 tests, and, and although the bank is the same, for citizenship, it's only required that someone taking this test answer 10 questions. So they, this 10 questions versus 100 questions, which is what we're requiring here. Now, last year, the Speaker's Task Force on Rural Schools made a strong recommendation to reduce or allow for a waiver of state mandates that place undue burden on rural schools. This legislation, on the contrary, creates another unfunded mandate. Administrators, teachers, and support staff in rural schools have been severely compressed. And so creating this mandate will require additional time for test administration, test scoring, reporting results, and it also will necessitate providing additional supports to students that have difficulty passing the test. And where are the resources to cover those costs? And so for those reasons, I, I hope that uh, we see significant modification or that this bill is not forwarded out of this committee. 
Thank you, Jerry. Um, and you indicated in, the, in your opening statement, you agree this is this this subject matter is something kids should know. Right. You you agree that this subject matter is something kids should know. Absolutely, absolutely, this is subject matter, and, and I believe that it's already uh, encompassed in our in our high school uh, curriculum, and it's also is, uh, is already being being taught. And, and I'm not so sure that we have a significant issue with students graduating from our high schools without the basic knowledge that we are talking about here. Representative Gannon. Just a quick question. Representative Clayton made a very good point. Okay. Let's try to make this work on both sides. Since you're already wording this subject, and don't you believe testing is a learning opportunity? You know, when people are taking a test, they're actually learning the material again by being refreshed somewhat. Is that correct answer? Testing is a learning opportunity? Certainly can. Depending. Should we, as the prior speaker said, some states have got less questions on the test to get it into a 50 minute period? Would that take some of the pain away? Go to 40, <coughs> random 40 out of the 100 instead of I believe it's 60. Is well, it depends on how it's structured. When you just look at what we now have in this bill, there obviously is uh, no no, uh, uh, no description of, of how it's administered, who administers it, how it's scored, how the results are reported. So there could be a significant amount of time that would be required uh, by this test. No, I think he did that. I think that was done on purpose to give you more flexibility. Um, doesn't the bill require 60 questions out of 100? Yes, yeah, 60 out of 100. Uh, analysis by reference bureau. If that was dropped to 40 out of 100, would you be able to get it into a class period? <coughs> 40. In other words, it was just random 40. I'm not saying you pass 40 out of 100. You only take. Oh, excuse me. Um, um, let's say it's a 50 question test instead of a 100 question test. <coughs> that make it easier to get into a class period. Well, so you would still have to pass 60 percent of the if, 50. If we're, so we're talking about it. the test that is now. Yes. Will be referenced here. Yes. This is a short answer. You have to write out the answer to these. Uh, so yes. obviously, this is more than what's required. That's the test. This is the test that is given for citizenship. Uh, there are ten questions. To multiple choices. Yeah, right. but, we're getting confused here. We were told that it was multiple choice today. We don't even know. It's not clarified. That's what happens. Oh, okay. We don't know. Okay. Yeah. It'll have to get amended to clarify. That's what I hear you all about. Yeah. I, I think that the uh, uh, the high stakes nature of the test is a significant concern in terms of uh, preventing students from graduation, causing a disruption. And I uh, thank you. Let me just ask one more thing. But don't you believe life is a little bit high stakes? In other words, you take a test, you're expected to pass. How do you how do you confirm you know the stuff if you don't pass the test? Is that what you're saying? High stakes is that you actually have to pass it. I keep hearing high stakes. In them. But, but 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 taking a test is part of your degree. Uh, <coughs> That's a part of the grade. There are other components that are part of that grade. You pass the course to obtain your credit, you attain the credits necessary for graduation. If all of a sudden you are presented with a do or die test, it creates another whole situation in terms of graduation. It puts another a significant higher uh, uh, amount of stress on the student versus what is normally required as a part of courses. You know, I, I think you, you just look at it, look at college courses, it'd be the same thing. To graduate from college, I mean, uh, you, you attain credits. But in order to graduate from college, before that time, you're not given a test to say this is a do or die. You pass this test or you're not going to be able to graduate, get your, high, your college diploma. You know, when you, have, when you add that aspect to it, it does change grammar. But as we stated earlier, it's not so high stakes and you can take it four or five times and you can pass it. And again, that's the reality. The author has indicated that you, you keep taking the test until you pass. So high stakes to me doesn't weigh in. Just saying. Representative Brockman. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, thank you very much. And thank you, Chair. And thanks for coming down to speak with us today. Um, I just want to say, I, as a professional in your field and someone who's working in, I'm from Milwaukee, so um, you know, it's a little bit different issues in the urban areas. But uh, from your perspective, has there been a significant burden um, placed in, in, in your area given, one, the lack of funding, especially what's 
happened last budget and what's going to happen this but you know what what's predicted to happen this budget and two the over the amount of uh, standardized tests that you're uh, required to take now and uh, has has that formula been better or worse overall for your students? Well, uh, I understand your question. In terms of funding, I think it's been well demonstrated uh, that there has been a significant reduction of funding for rural schools because of a whole number of factors. And that, that has come through clearly in the, uh, the intense uh, uh, study that was done by the Rural Task Force. They've verified that fact. In terms of testing, if you're asking, uh, is increased uh, a yes. test? Putting well, a greater pressure on rural schools. Well, rural schools it has, and, and I guess has has my question is more, and this is Trevor Stone again. His previous point says, "Well, you learn by testing." And I think, I mean, I don't know. It's not my area of expertise. I don't know if that's correct or not correct. But I think there might be some merit to it. I want to know the amount of testing, the amount of tests that you're now forced to give. Has that been helpful or hurtful? Uh, towards your student population? I, I, think it, I think it's been very harmful in terms of when you look right now, and, I, and if, I, if I remember right, I think the DPI listed all the tests uh, that are now required. When you look at the, the, the list of that test, and you go back uh, five years ago, eight years ago, that list was a fraction of that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this has taken a significant amount of instructional time to be able to uh, apply all of these tests, which has a negative effect in terms of what you can accomplish with your I've your heard the exact same sentiment from our urban teachers, but thank you for your perspective and thank you very much. Any other questions for Mr. Feeney? With that, I just want to apologize. I'm not yelling at Mr. Feeney, but we've worked together so much, I know the background noise affects his hearing. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and see, here's the problem. Uh, I read lips, and you've got a big window right behind you. Right? <laughs> I can't you read your lips. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not yelling at Jerry. We know each other well enough. Right? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Council. Quick question. Sure. Bill. Kids, anywhere in the stills or opt outs or parents or is that covered somewhere else? Other tests? Um, no, there is no opt out. Should ask that that could be your family. Uh, next up we have Tamara Jackson speaking for information only, Wisconsin Board for People with Developmental Disabilities. Hello, Tamara. Hello. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, know, you for coming. Thank you for waiting. No problem. I think this is the first time I've ever been before this particular committee. So well, I'm glad excited. to have you. Yeah, well. Very excited. Um, I work for the Wisconsin Board for People with Developmental Disabilities. We are charged under federal law for with advocacy and systems change uh, to improve the lives of people with disabilities in all areas. I actually brought some uh, testimony with me from Lisa Pugh as well from Disability Rights Wisconsin. She couldn't be at the hearing today, so you get, you get her substitute from a different organization reading different testimony because I work. Um, we know that research has shown at the national level that 99% of students, including those with disabilities, can learn grade level content in the general education curriculum and achieve proficiency on grade level standards with the appropriate supports. So learning for, um, and obviously my organization works for, with people with developmental disabilities, that includes things um, like intellectual and cognitive disabilities, which have been mentioned a couple of times, as well as developmental disabilities that have a more physical nature, cerebral palsy, uh, epilepsy, those um, types of conditions. Learning for, for this population is really not an issue of a lack of intelligence or capacity, but often of time and educational strategies that are needed to meet um, this population where they are in, the, in their disability. Um, we think that high expectations for all students are important. People with disabilities vote. They participate in public affairs, and a basic understanding of civics is important for all citizens, including those with disabilities. However, for this particular population, in order to meet those high expectations, they, they need to learn civics content in the same environment as their peers, number one, and to have their knowledge evaluated by a test that accommodates their disability. Um, federal law, I think D referenced the let me get the acronym right, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, does recognize that students with disabilities can learn alongside their peers, but they may require specific learning strategies in order to achieve proficiency in a content area or need some accommodations to, um, in order to participate with peers in an evaluation and standardized testing. 
Um, and the individual education plan, or IEP, that's also been mentioned, is intended to kind of outline the learning supports that an individual and accommodations necessary for a student to achieve the goals in their plan. Um, so IDEA, the federal law, requires all children with disabilities to be included in all general and state district-wide assessment programs with appropriate accommodations and alternate assessments uh, where necessary, as indicated in their IEPs. So it's kind of, you know, depending on the IEP, you may need different things for the individual child. Um, in you know, in some school districts, and I think some of the folks in this room may have attended um, the board's uh, tour of Stoughton High School earlier this year. In some school districts, there's been a lot of progress made on including students with disabilities in the regular classroom at all times. And, and we've actually seen some demonstrable research that that improves um, academic achievement for both populations. Um, but that is not necessarily the norm in all districts. Um, so one of our concerns is that students with disabilities, especially if they are pulled out um, and separated from regular content, may not have access to the civics content that is taught. And this particular bill does not contain language that guarantees that students with disabilities will be instructed on tested material in the general education environment, at, which would also ensure that they are tested on material they've actually learned in the classroom. Um, Stoughton High School uh, has a lot of, of work between special educators and regular classroom teachers. It's almost a co-teaching model. So, um, you know, students that, you know, you don't just throw a student in, in the general education classroom and assume they're going to absorb things. You have a pair of teachers really working together to figure out the best strategy for those students to learn in that setting. Um, the bill as drafted does not appear to require that the exit exam include allowable accommodations or alternative assessments for students. Um, so to be clear, an accommodation does not necessarily mean a different or modified test needs to be created. Accommodations are made for the individual student with a disability in order for them to be able to complete the test. And some of the examples of an accommodation might include perhaps allowing a longer length of time for the test to be taken, um, taking the exam in a quieter um, or separate room to avoid distractions. My friends with autism would find this low lighting and <laughs> echoing in this room probably insurmountable. Um, you know, so those kinds of, of things are, are strategies. Um, sometimes you may need somebody to actually mark a student's um, answers on a test. I'm thinking of the little thought bubbles that we all remember filling out with the number two pencil. Um, if you have cerebral palsy and have fine motor control challenges, um, that you know you need somebody to to direct to the answers that you want. Um, and in some cases, reading test questions aloud to the student um, may be necessary. A lot of times, a uh, student's comprehension of of the content may be fine, um, but. For example, vision impairment may make the completion of the test um, not uh, possible in the allotted time frame. Um, some students might require a modified test, an alternative assessment, and that really is code for they can demonstrate the content knowledge, but the test may be slightly different in structure and presentation than for students without disabilities. So, you know, I think when we're looking at this bill, and it sounds like there's some, some opportunity for friendly amendments, um, it would be important to make sure that students with disabilities have a guaranteed access to the same civic content that's going to be examined on. They're taught that content in, in a regular classroom or at least, you know, are getting the same information as their peers. Um, and that required exams allow um, accommodations or um, alternative assessments as appropriate under the IEP. Um, and the reason why we are a little bit concerned about this bill, I know the <coughs> term high stakes has been used a bit. Um, for, for our population, a high school diploma, a regular high school diploma, really greatly increases the chances of a student with a disability to secure employment <laughs> or go on to other training and become employed in the community and all of these other things. Um, so we don't want to create un unintentionally additional barriers for this population. This is a population that already has um, graduation rates that are lower than average. And you know, one of the things that, that many um, disability groups have been working on is to, to try and improve the system so that we are removing those barriers and are really trying to find ways to um, 
to make sure that our students with disabilities end up with the same outcome as their peers. Um, so that is kind of why we are here. We have no opposition to the bill or the content, as, as other people have said, but we do think there's room for amendment uh, to guarantee that those students um, are, are achieving the same as their peers. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your testimony. Representative Jagler. So based on, what I'm, on your comments there, uh, an amendment to exempt the student from an IEP wouldn't, wouldn't satisfy. Okay, I, I mean, you, you would want more than an exemption. You I, would want them to still be, still be <coughs> material, as it were. Yeah, I think that an exemption is one method. I mean, you can't exempt this population from taking the test at all. Um, where we were coming from is we think that the content is important for all students, and, I, and you can do an, an amendment to just say, hey, let's make sure that for these populations, mm -hmm. we're Such kind of mirroring. the previous speaker saying exactly. that there's an, event, there's an exemption from the testing requirement, but the material still be yeah. Presented yeah. And I, I'm not sure we need to exempt them from the testing requirement just to make sure that the accommodations are are present. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe that the previous speaker didn't exempt them from taking the test, uh, but ex exempted um, the the requirement for graduation uh, passage. That's important clarification. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for General? Seeing none, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next up, we have Betsy Kipper, Kippers from WEAC speaking against. Hello, Betsy. Hello. Thank you, Representative Swearer, and all the committee members for giving me an opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I'm Betsy Kippers. I am a teacher. I'm an educator from Racine, currently serving as the Wisconsin Education Association Council President, and we represent teachers from across the state as well as advocate for 865,000 public education students. We are here speaking in opposition to the bill because of testing, not because of the need for our students to be strong citizens and civically minded. That is important. I don't care who you are or where you live. I'm here today to share with you our concerns about Assembly Bill 194. This legislation adds one more test to the growing list of mandated tests that our students are required to take. There are both federal mandates and state mandates, and this adds one more. Most of the ex existing tests are used to assess, assess our kids or are administered as part of the famous school accountability requirements at either the federal or state level. The newly proposed test in AB 194 takes this to a whole nother level. It denies diplomas if you don't pass this test. That's a lot higher stake than any other test that we currently give. You know, I want you to know that teachers are not against testing. I believe probably tests were invented by a teacher way back when. But what we believe is one test does not tell a story and should not be the thing that measures success. There are multiple measures. Think of what civic engagement is. Besides answering those memorized questions, which to be very honest, many of our citizens that take that exam will memorize and pass and six months later will forget 30 to 50% of the content. What are they doing to show respect and responsibility in the school setting? What are they doing to help and support students that might be struggling? What are they doing as a student to help their community? That's civic responsibility. No test measures that. There are other ways we need to gauge those things. We do not need a dangerous path that leads to opening the options for other tests to be introduced that will lead to fewer graduates and more dropouts because of the stress we will put on mandated testing. This insanity has to end. Students need more time to learn, to foster creativity, and they don't need more testing. Consider the fact that the Federal Elementary and Secondary Education Act, most of you know it as No Child Left Behind, it more than doubled, more than doubled the number of mandatory tests in reading and math, just two subjects. And now we're gonna add more. That is not the right path to go down. T 
test preparation administration takes time away from teachers teaching and students learning. We want broad-based learning, not narrow learning tied to a test. A survey by the National Education Association found that teachers who taught classes where students took a state standardized test spent an average 29%, 29% of their work time on tasks related to that specific test. The vast majority of that time was spent on preparation how to take the test, and very little time was given to to what the test results could be used for to improve instruction. Will this test inform instruction? I don't see that in the test. Testing not only cuts into time to teach and learn, it drives the curriculum. So what has been the experience in schools across the state? Many people have already talked about this. Tested, tested subjects are given a higher priority. Can't dispute that. But that leads to loss of music, art, physical education, technical education, and so much more. Should we really be giving up one thing for another when what we want of all of our citizens is to have access to a very well-rounded, broad-based education? Or will this open the Pandora's box to testing each and every single subject we test with a mandated state test. When does the insanity end? We know what our students need. Give us time to give it to them. You know, as I travel, travel around the state and talk with educators, parents, and communities, I hear time and time again about concerns and questions about all of this testing. At what cost is this? And I'm not talking financial cost. I'm talking education cost. What purpose does it really serve? Does it do anything to boost our student achievement? Does it do anything to address the opportunity gaps we have in our public education system? How does it truly impact educational opportunity for all? Or are we just turning our schools into a giant test prep center? And is that what we really want? You and I really do believe that the author of the bill hoped AB 194 would lead to a better informed, civic-minded students entering the world of work or college. And it was a laudable goal. But however, our educators question whether students memorizing facts about our country's history and our country's government structure gets us there. Citizenship is about so much more. It, it embodies values that educators work to instill in their students every day. Values like honesty, courage, compassion, responsibility, and respect. Things you can't test on a multiple choice test. Adding another test to the mix would only exasperate the excessive testing problem. We need to ask ourselves whether we truly want educators spending more time teaching to the test or teaching to the child. I know my members believe their time is better spent instilling, instilling the love of learning in our students and dispelling the time on testing. And they're not alone. We are hearing it from parents across the state and across the country. They know their children are so much more than just a test score. For all of these reasons, please oppose Assembly Bill 194. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. Uh, any questions for Betsy? Representative uh, Sinecki. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. Um, if I could get up and applaud you if our rules allowed it, I would. You hit the nail on the head. Um, and I liked your comments about um, kids don't learn by, you know, just regurgitating information. How long has it been since you've been in the classroom? I've been out of the classroom eight years, but I actually am in the classrooms at least once a month teaching with the teachers because I miss it so much. I can't stand it. And I was a teacher for 30 years. Okay. So let me just, I had a question that I, I wrote down in my phone and I got it. Somebody else has something for they can go ahead and ask it. Um, um, so as a teacher, What I mean, because I don't like I said, I'm a firm believer in teachers. Uh, kids don't learn by 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 reading and writing. They learn by doing. Now I just took part in a 
program, I wasn't physically there, but somebody played me in this program, where they had a mock legislature. And you're, I mean, in your mind, isn't that really better for these kids to teach them? Exactly. It's yeah. a real life experience. It's a real yes. life experience about learning how does the legislative process work. Yes. Besides being given facts, to even sit in a room like this and witness it. Um, we bring our students here from around the state all the time to witness this type of activity and to partake in, partake in civic engagement, and that's what they learn more about. Facts are not the only thing they need to know. They need to honestly witness and experience, whether it's a mock or not, how it works. Thank you. I'm a firm believer in that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thanks for your testimony today, and happy um, National Teachers Appreciation Thank you, Week. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for your service to our, to our students. Um, you've been here the whole time today, I've noted, and um, you've heard a lot of talk about um, different amendments, um, amendment for this, an amendment for that. Um, is there anything, that, any combination of things that you've heard that, that would make this bill acceptable to you? Not in terms of making another mandated test. I believe the amendments talked about are needed if you're going to mandate a test, because I have a special education background, so that's near and dear to me. But I don't think a mandated test gets to what we need to get to, and that's eventually saying, when are we gonna allow teachers to teach broad-based teaching, because even the people testifying for the bill admitted that the only reason they want it tested because then it gets more emphasis of teaching. We've got to get away from that because this will lead to a Pandora's box of who's going to come here next and mandate testing in what subject area. Just one follow-up, Mr. Chair, if I may. Um, what about an amendment that would require that people took a test uh, but that it was not a uh, requirement for graduation? Just so, people so students had an idea of um, what things that they may have learned in fourth grade um, if they um, were paying attention in fourth grade. I know a lot of fourth graders that don't always pay attention at that stage of their life. But if they were paying attention in fourth grade um, and sometime in high school had to try to remember kind of the basis of a lot of things that happened in our government and our history of our country. Um, what about that possibility? Would that be acceptable to you? That's what I'm talking about with testing. A test that's just going to inform what the teacher needs to teach, and there are some tests out there that our teachers are using that do that, that's acceptable. But once it's mandated to get you to do X, Y, or Z, such as graduate, that puts a, it also puts a different pressure on the students, and they would testify to that if they were here. I've got pictures of kids crying. But they don't realize that when we do an oral or a test, that same hundred or I'm not going to argue the number of questions, the format, and all that stuff, that's different when it's given in a classroom as part of a curriculum requirement. So um, just to make sure I know what it is that you're saying, a curriculum requirement without um, passage to assure a high school degree um, would be acceptable to you? I'd have to see, I'd never say yes until of I course. see it, but yes, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. And I don't know, I, we don't technically require specific curriculum in the state, but the DPI does regulate requirements of what should be taught in different levels. So that's okay. why I'm iffy about how to answer the question. Sure, of course. In terms of the legal, current, what our structure is. And I have found out that varies all over the United States as I've traveled around on bills like this. <coughs> Any other questions for Betsy? Seeing none, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next up, Steve Arnold, speaking against. Thank you, sir. How are you? I'm doing fine. Good, thank you for waiting. Um, it's been a long wait. Um, I, my name is Steve Arnold, I, I live here in Madison. Um, I have uh, spent my lifetime uh, being passionate about the business of improving civic education. Um, uh, actually, I retired in 2002 and uh, started in 1968. And uh, am, I am still uh, intensely and passionately involved. And uh, Representative Sineke, did that student text you from Middleton? Uh, I Doesn't don't know. know. That does I wanted to get myself a number. <laughs> <laughs> 
so I, I, I'm, still, I'm still deeply engaged and passionate in this business of improving civics education. And I, I'm, in, I'm involved, I'm engaged with researchers, I'm engaged with practitioners. And I have to tell you, there is not one person I know. Nobody would support this bill. Nobody would support a civics exit test. Everyone believes in, I mean, there is not a person in this room, there's probably not a person in this community or in the state who doesn't want to see improved civic education. We're, we all understand, we all know what the statistics are with regard to the performance of students. Things do need to be improved, but this is not the way you improve civics education. It's a disservice, in fact, to the effort to improve civics education. Education is a serious business. You know that, I know that. It's a serious business for every discipline in a school. And that certainly includes civics. But this bill is not a serious bill with regard to moving in that direction. And what, as I sat here and listened, what disturbed me the most <coughs> is that the author of the bill and many of those speaking clearly were touting this bill as a way to improve civics education. Nothing can be further from the truth. So I, I, um, I had uh, numerous other things to say, but uh, the previous speaker said them for me, so uh, you were able to benefit uh, with my more abbreviated uh, talk and presentation to you. So thank you for the opportunity to uh, have some, make some comments. Thank you, uh, Mr. Arnold, for coming. Representative Jankler. If you can, can you just give a, a brief explanation as to your strong there that requiring a test on civic edu civics doesn't help? I'm saying. I, 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 can you just explain oh, the process of why? why okay, now, I'm going to help you. Um, yes, I'll be glad to uh, comment. Um, I, as a person who had been an educator for 36 years in a public school, um, I would say the least important thing uh, is a test, is the kind of information you'd find on the proposed test. The least important dimension of creating a strong, constructive, and positive um, uh, civics program. Um, yeah, yeah. Do you believe in testing at all? Um, I'm, I, 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 I did I very little. Um, I'm not opposed to those who test. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm not opposed because um, for, for one reason I think that uh, if every teacher had been like I, I don't think that that would have served education well. I think the strength of uh, the business of education is in the diversity of the kinds and the types of teachers and, 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 uh, and approaches. And um, so, uh, no, I'm not, I'm not uh, just unilaterally opposed, but um, I, I, fi I find it, particularly in the field of, uh, of civics education, to be so unnecessary. What you want in a civics program are students developing and learning the skills, and I think that uh, the, wo the woman, uh, the lady uh, previous to me was really speaking to that. They need to know how to, com they, they need to know how to construct an argument, they, know how to present, they need to know how to present an argument, on and on, they need to understand issues. I mean, civics education is so far beyond this whole concept of an exit test. I have to say, uh, if I may make one, one last remark and comment, I, um, I, I believe that legislation can do so much for in, in, in a lot of fields, and, and it can, it, legislation can make a great contribution to the business of improving education and improving civics education. But this is not the kind of legislation that's needed. And if you want to look at a model that's going on right now, a model that a model that is an effort to improve civics education, take a look at what's going on in Illinois right now with their effort in their legislature. Um, there's, uh, I'll just leave it with that. They're, they're in the midst of a bill having passed the House and going into the Senate. And um, okay. it's, it's interesting. So thank you very much. Any other questions for Mr. Arnold? Thank you very much for uh, sticking around. Next up is Chris Amity from the ACLU of Wisconsin. Speaking against. Welcome, Chris. Good 
Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Thanks for this opportunity to address you on Assembly Bill 194. I'm Chris Amity. I'm the Executive Director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Wisconsin. I would uh, love to be able to support a bill that improves uh, civics education and enhances the ability of our students to uh, participate in civics. Uh, the ACLU, in our role as an uh, advocacy organization for the civil liberties and civil rights of all Wisconsinites, is out in the community and in the schools all the, the all the time, and we've got a fair amount of experience in figuring out what motivates people, what enables people to participate. I'm asking the uh, aide to pass around a copy of our uh, know Your Rights bus card. This is just one simple thing that we do. We've passed out tens of thousands of them. Um, this is something that enables students to understand their rights and responsibilities when it comes to an encounter with law enforcement. Don't run. Don't argue. You know, make sure that you uh, leave the uh, encounter uh, and are able to, to go home and, at the end of the evening. Just a little bit of information on this bus card is still uh, so much more than the answer to a, a question on the, the naturalization test that I've looked at myself. So we've talked about having critical knowledge, but I think to serve uh, students well, we need to have actionable knowledge. I've been trying to, to figure out what's, been, what's, what's going on with this bill since I learned about it yesterday. Um, and so being here at the, uh, the hearing uh, today has been very informative. And I'm still a little confused about uh, some things. Uh, Mr. Feeney appears to have left. But he was saying how these issues are, are taught in the schools and the information is out there. Mr. Stone appears to suggest that STEM and other factors are pushing this out of the schools and, and we, we don't get enough attention on this and that the test would somehow uh, fix that. Um, whether or not the test fix, fixes it, I think it, uh, the sponsor, um, the representative from Glen Floor, really should be commended for raising the, the issue when there are all the demands on our education dollars out there. But I don't know that um, this is necessarily the best way to get there. Um, <coughs> Representative Sinicki, a couple hours ago or whenever that was, asked if this uh, proposal had anything to do with uh, ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. I don't know if it does or not. I think Mr. Stone would have told us if it did. But there is a proposal that ALEC has got. If you go to their website, you'll find the Civic Literacy Act, and it talks particularly about foundational documents like the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and the Federalist Papers and, and all that. And it's got um, not just a test about it, but it also talks about how to teach about it. So there's lots of different proposals on how to handle improvements in civic education from all over the political spectrum, I, I suspect. So I'm glad that the sponsor is willing to take um, amendments, consider uh, amendments, but we need something more than just amendments to tweak this and accommodate that. We really need to uh, see if there's a place for something like this in a broader approach to address um, civic education. You know, I'm sorry that Representative Dannon isn't here because he raised a couple issues. And he asked Mr. Stone, you know, has this test harmed anyone? And Mr. Stone answered, well, um, no. But on the other hand, it's just being implemented. Implemented. So how do we know? You know, do we know how many people have failed the, the test in Arizona and have had to go back and take it over and over again? How much teacher time was part of that effort to do it over again? You know, we really don't uh, know that. Uh, Mr. Stone also said that this is a floor and, you know, it's, this is just the start and we're going to improve um, civics education. The trouble is it's a floor with a trap door. 
because if you don't pass and you don't spend all those resources taking the test over and over again or whatever, you know, it, you're not going to get a high school diploma, and that's incredibly uh, important. So, yes, civics education, but not um, this. There may certainly these issues are are good, but we need actionable knowledge. Just you know, the list that the U.S. Uh, Naturalization Service comes up with. So there's a lot more that should be done, and I hope to participate in that discussion about what can be done, because I want to thank the representative for, for starting that. So I'd be happy to try to answer any questions that uh, members have at this time. Any questions from the committee for Chris? <clears throat> representative Zimbabwe. Thank you, Mr. Amity, for your testimony. Now, I, I haven't looked at your slip, but I, is the ACLU registering the application of this bill? Yes. Okay. Um, you know, maybe there's a version, maybe there's a sub-amendment or something that we could support or at least not oppose, but uh, help. this is very well intentioned, I'm sure, but um, we can't support it in this current form. Thank you. Any other questions for Chris? Seeing none, thank you very much for your thank testimony. You. Next up, we have uh, Daryl Morin, the League of United Latin American Citizens from uh, Muskego. Welcome, Daryl. Thanks for coming. It's a pleasure to be here and to speak before you and all the distinguished members of this committee. It's my hope here today to um, give context to a lot of the things we're talking and not just provide subjective information, but objective information based on the laws of the land as well and share that with members of this committee. So with that being said, uh, Chairman, uh, and distinguished members of this committee, I wish to thank you for holding this hearing on Assembly Bill 194 and giving me an opportunity to testify on behalf of not only myself as a citizen or resident of uh, Wisconsin, but as National Vice President for our nation's oldest and largest Hispanic membership-based organization, the League of United Latin American Citizens, or LULAC. I represent over 130,000 advocates and solution providers throughout the nation. We are a nonpartisan organization, and I am responsible for a 12 state region for handling uh, or overseeing all advocacy, awareness, and assistance operations. Uh, for the record, we are a nonpartisan organization. Okay? Let me start off by saying we are heavily invested in the education of every student in the state of Wisconsin. I don't know if any of you are aware, but we currently operate a LULAC Community Technology Center out of Waukesha, Wisconsin. Realizing that proper nutrition plays a very important role uh, in every student's ability to learn, uh, we, with our partners at Tyson, have donated just under 100,000 pounds of meat to those families here in the state of Wisconsin that suffer from food insecurity. We've provided over $1,250,000 in scholarships to talented and gifted Hispanic American students here in the state of Wisconsin. We've provided schools in need over $500,000 in reading intervention software to make sure that we can improve our NAEP scores when it comes to reading here in Wisconsin. We've also spent over an exploratory system in Milwaukee, we've spent over $250,000 in a dual enrollment program that takes some of the students from the most challenged high schools in Milwaukee and we take them out of there and we move them to community, uh, the local community college where they're earning college credits and at a rate of 100%, they are now graduating high school and being transitioned to college. So that's a program we are very proud of. I share these contributions not to boast about our accomplishments, but to underscore <coughs> that LULAC is not an organization with the sole purpose of pointing out the opportunities to improve, but to actually engage and provide solutions to resolve those issues. We, um, we do this um, through our nonprofit and private partnerships with organizations such as Ford, Walmart, McDonald's, Miller Coors here in the state, and many more. I'm very proud to say that of all those programs I mentioned, not over 99% of those programs were privately funded through LULAC, through LULAC and our, pro our partnerships with nonprofits or other private entities, and not by the federal or state government. So we are heavily invested here in the state of Wisconsin. 
We are founded on the guiding principle that helping Hispanics integrate, not assimilate, into the American cultural fabric is essential. Much of our Constitution, in fact, at LULAC is based on the U.S. Constitution. Our LULAC prayer is actually an adaptation of Thomas Jefferson's Prayer for a Nation, which is a phenomenal piece of writing. Our flag is the U.S. flag. Our song is America the Beautiful, and I could go on and on. We open and close every meeting, or open every meeting, with the, the Pledge of Allegiance as well. So since our inception in 1929, LULAC members have fought to defend our nation, both on foreign battlefields, but when necessary, locally here at home in our courts. Never asking for something given, but the equal opportunity afforded us under the U.S. Constitution for an equal opportunity to earn the American dream. So this brings me to today. While LULAC firmly believes that each and every child has the right to a world-class education, and while LULAC agrees that strong foundational understanding of civics is critical to achieving that goal, in its current form, we are not able to support the bill, but would welcome the opportunity to work with the officers, authors to correct it. We believe that in its current forms, there are questions with regards to its constitutionality, and it would also put Wisconsin's federal dollars for education at risk, as written. So I'll go ahead and list some of these, and you'll find out uh, everybody should have gotten the, the written testimony. I've actually put some uh, resources in here that I will be referencing throughout my testimony. So first, English language exemptions. The current draft of AP 194 makes no reference to support for English language learners or students whose native language is not English. This is a, con a serious concern for newly arrived students, not only from non-English speaking countries, but from commonwealths and territories and areas within the United States, people who are US citizens whose uh, native language is not English, believe it or not, yeah. right? So if there are ELL students with insufficient knowledge of the English language, there must be language exceptions that allow them to demonstrate their civics knowledge in alternate ways, similar to the practices that the USCIS that we keep talking about all day. If you go to, and forgive me for not having them uh, labeled, but behind the third tab, you're going to see the list of exemptions and exceptions made by the USCIS with regards to English language learners with those with learning disabilities and more. So I provided that as a resource for, for everyone on the committee here today. Number uh, three, support and resources for teachers. There must be specific commitments in the legislation that expands teacher resources, supports, and training to help them prepare from the classroom for these civic assessments. They cannot be unfunded mandates on the teachers who have to prepare for it without the required training, resources, and support. I'm going to deviate from the written testimony here to add. I think most of the, the things and comments I've heard here today assume that somebody is a lifelong learner in the state of Wisconsin. We do know that we do have uh, people moving into the state, et cetera, both from other states and from outside of what we consider the continental United States that may not have had previous access to this information, and as such, accommodations should be made for them. Number four, non-discrimination language. It is important that every member of this distinguished body understand the importance to this point. No language in the bill can be supersede federal civil rights laws that prohibit discrimination in programs or activities that receive federal funds. These laws prohibit <coughs> discrimination on the basis of race, color, nas national, nation of origin, language, sex, disability, and basis of age. These laws extend to all state education uh, agencies, elementary, secondary school systems, colleges, universities, vocational schools, libraries, rehabilitation uh, agencies, and more. And if you'll indulge me for one moment. With two young children, every time I, they come home with something, I pick it up as well, unfortunately. <laughs> So this legislature uh, may also wish to address potential methods of recourse for students denied graduation certificate because their school district failed to provide them with the needed instruction and proper instruction necessary to, to pass the exam. Once again, understand that, that many students don't begin their educational process here in the state of Wisconsin and may have moved in. I'd be remiss in my duty to LULAC as well as a resident of the state if I did not bring up other concerns and um, safeguards or things that this committee may wish to, to consider. Um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, particularly Title VI, provides protections against discrimination of individuals based on national origin, race, color, as well as language. I've, and once again, I'm gonna deviate shortly. 
Behind the first tab, you're going to find the most recent report put out by the Office of Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Education called Protecting Civil Rights and Advancing Equity. In there, you're going to find Title VI, and I think it's page 18, clearly defined, with all the supports that must be afforded every student in any educational uh, format. So that's in there for you to re review. There's also case and examples of where the Office of Civil Rights has um, had to negotiate or um, seek um, uh, judicial relief for violations of that. So once again, that is in here for your reference. Um, so I will go back to my written testimony. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, particularly Title VI, provides protections against discrimination of individuals based on national origin, race, color, as well as language, as it pertains to access to public education. As such, federal law prohibits denying students access to public education on their account or on their parents' national origin. The Supreme Court has affirmed that citizenship and immigration status on students, parents, guardians, etc., cetera, um, do not bar students from attending public public schools as referenced in Plyler versus Doe in 1982. The Department of Education, through the Office of Civil Rights, works to ensure that schools enrollment policies and practices, and this would apply there, are consistent with Title VI's prohibition against discrimination based on race, color, or national origin. More to the point, there are specific areas covered under Title VI as it relates to language. I have submitted with my testimony, and I referenced that before, a copy of a recent report issued by the Department of Education Office of Civil Rights for the committee's benefit. It details the department's enforcement and compliance activities aimed at ensuring that students like English language learners have the support they need to do well in school. Per the report, and I quote, it is important to note that students whose first language is not English, or English learners in parentheses, EL students, may require language supports in order to meaningf meaningfully participate in school. Title VI requires that state education agencies, SEAs, and districts take affirmative steps to address language barriers so that EL students may participate meaningfully in their school's educational programs. A district must effectively implement a sound educational approach in its programs for EL students Title VI also requires the schools adequately communicate with limited English proficient LEP parents about important school related information on languages they cannot understand. OCR sought to ensure that limited English proficiency is not an obstacle for students or their parents to uh, educational opportunities. A school district that denies an ELL student a graduation credential on account of the results of an English-only assessment based on the U.S. citizenship test without concern for the child's language ability may in fact be breaking federal law because they did not ensure that said student uh, receive the proper support needed to meaningfully participate in school and take affirmative steps to address language barriers that affect ELL student scores on civics tests. This information is particularly important in the context that AB 194 requires students pass a civics assessment, which by the direct verbiage of the legislation requires it to be identical to the U.S. citizenship test as provided by the USCIS as a requirement to confer graduation credentials. A school district that denies a student a graduation credential on account of the result of an English-only assessment based directly on a U.S. citizenship test, um, but then tells the same students and parents that they did not discriminate based on national origin would be seen by most as inherently problematic. Considering the proven history of discrimination against U.S.-born Latinos and other minorities, there could be concern amongst many as well in the community that this legislation, legislation was, actually a, was actually a patriotic litmus test on minorities. Conferring a graduation credential is, is something that should not be taken lightly. Students need these credentials to be able to be competitive in a job market, to be able to earn more money, pay more taxes, purchase more goods and services, and it's been proven that they live longer and have a higher quality of life. So denying credentials on account of civics tests that are administered in English only uh, is a concern. And it is not a new concept. Unfortunately, though I believe this is well-intentioned legislation, in the past it has been used to deny people the right to vote. So I ask you to weigh these important um, recommendations, and we'd be more than willing to work with the author and others with regards to this. Once again, distinguished gentle ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate your time and serious consideration on this proposed bill. May the Lord bless all of you. May he bless the great state of Wisconsin, and may he bless the United States of America. Thank you very much, dear.
Any questions from the committee for Daryl? Thank you. Representative Nikki. Thank, uh, thank you for, I, in my husband, we're going to be using these materials, not just for this bill. Very helpful. And uh, thank you for putting this together for us. Pleasure. Um, I got a couple questions. Do you have any idea how many not citizen students are in our schools in the state of Wisconsin? I don't have any um, numbers that I'm comfortable in okay. sharing uh, because of lack of information. Um, I will make a more general statement though based on Hispanic students. I was um, asked to lead the Hispanic outreach effort for the city of Milwaukee in 2010. And we found a substantial growth uh, model there uh, for Hispanics moving into the state. Uh, we realized very, very small and modest growth here in the state of, I want to say it was under 6%. As you know, the level of federal funding that flows into the state, as well as congressional representation, is tied to population. Had it not been for a 74% increase of Hispanics coming to the state uh, in the previous 10 years, uh, Wisconsin would have been in some pretty <coughs> difficult straits. So there's been a significant influx, which has contributed to our economy, uh, which has also substantially lowered the median average worker age here in the state of Wisconsin. Um, earlier in the, in the hearing, um, I did ask the author of the bill uh, about non-citizen students taking the, the test for graduation and the legal legalities of that and how that would be handled. There was some confusion as to whether or not, the way I understood that I was hearing from the author of the bill, he believes that if, a, if children come into the country with their parents are automatically citizens. I don't believe that's true. Um, not being an immigration attorney, I, I can't offer professional expertise. I will show, share with you, it hasn't been our experience that that is necessarily the case. It is usually quite a lengthy and expensive process, should you be fortunate enough um, to be able to even come in to begin with. So, so that's, I mean, basically, I mean, those are the dreamers. Those are the children that we, that we now refer to they as the dreamers. They that category as well. Correct? Right, right. So I did ask the author also if it was possible, you know, if we could work with the federal government. If, if they're honestly going to give this test, can it be used as a citizenship test for those children? I think, I think it would be an excellent <coughs> idea because I think the end goal here is to make sure that everybody becomes a good, lawful, right. and economic, you know, contributing citizen here. So I think, I think that would be a, a, a marvelous consideration there. Once again, I don't want my testimony to be construed to be against. It's just in the current form, and we'd love to have a chance to work with the committee and the authors uh, right to bring the compliance. Uh, good legal issues with the bill. Thank you. Um, for, if I can just include, before I forget, a point of information. If anybody goes to the USCIS website and you do a search for, actually if you just Google, uh, is the um, uh, USCIS citizenship test um, multiple choice, it will say is not in, in, in big block letters, not multiple choice. So once again, just things that I'm sure we can work with the authors on. So, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moody, for your testimony. and. Uh, your very thorough research and, and providing um, these materials to us. Uh, I also wanted to, I am a proud recipient of a scholarship from LULAC as a Wisconsin Hispanic youth and was able to uh, attend college and, and get help to purchase my books through LULAC. It's nice to know we have somebody here in the state legislature. We also had a man up on the space shuttle, so we're very, very proud of, of some of these accomplishments. Um, and I wanted to point out for the, for the committee um, something very important that you indicated, and that is we have U.S. citizens, absolutely U.S. citizens here, that are not English dominant. Uh, English is not their first language, and thank you for reminding us um, of that. Um, when I think of my constituency, I, as you know, I represent the largest Latino constituency in the great state of Wisconsin in the 8th Assembly District. Our, my Puerto Rican constituents, um, many of them hail from the island of Puerto Rico, absolutely a U.S. territory. They are U.S. citizens, but they may prefer and are Spanish dominant. So it's, it's important that we, that we know, and thank you for doing so, that we're not, um, we are not talking solely about the but maybe yeah. English language learners. So I just wanted to thank you for, for pointing that out. 
Mr. Chair, if I may ask one comment. My apologies, I just learned of this yesterday, so this is the result of about maybe three or four hours work. Um, one concern that I know I received from some of our membership, because we don't know legally if it applies, maybe DPI or, or council can, can refer to this, is the impact this would have on GED programs. Because we do know we have a sizable um, Spanish-speaking um, population that is working and has gone through the GED process, and I don't know how this would, would apply. Something else for this committee, perhaps, and the author to consider. So, thank you. Fair enough. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Marin? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. It's a pleasure. Very thank thorough. you all. Uh, Chris Kulo from the Wisconsin Association of School Boards speaking again. Thanks for waiting out today. Absolutely. Yeah, Somebody absolutely. had to go last. That guy is right here. All right. Um, I, I am Chris Kulo. I'm the government relations specialist with the Wisconsin Association of School Boards. Um, I would say that uh, first point I'd like to make is that the WASB does support uh, emphasizing citizenship and patriotism in the classroom. Um, one of the handouts uh, that you'll be receiving is a publication we put out to our members on the topic, kind of highlighting best practices at, at various school districts in the state on that topic. Um, that being said, uh, we, we do oppose the bill as written because in our view it would be an unfunded state mandate on local schools. Uh, it would add to the test burden on our kids and it would be Wisconsin's first high stakes graduation test. Um, you will be getting my testimony so I'm not going to rehash all the arguments that have already been mentioned. I would just say that, that we still have concerns about the evidence for the need for this bill in Wisconsin. Um, and whether the proposed solution would improve the situation. Um, you know, I, I, I would question the assertion that civics is not em emphasized currently and would wonder what the, what the, again, the evidence for that statement would be. Um, we still have questions about the implementation of the test and the cost to local school districts for implementing the test. Um, and then, like I said, we still have the, the concern about adding to the test burden. I did list all the current state and federally mandated tests in my testimony, so I won't go over that again either. Um, at this point, I would just wrap up and say that um, everything's been pretty much covered already, so uh, we would welcome the opportunity to work with the bill's author, too, on any changes to the bill, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate you sticking around for your testimony. No problem. And, uh, you still agree that this is a material that kids should be taught, right? Absolutely. Okay. Any other questions for Chris, Representative Zambri? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, but you also indicated the kids are already being taught this. Uh -huh. Correct. Thank you. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anybody else here wishing to speak on uh, AB 194? If not, then I can tell you that registering uh, against Jeannie Ogden from Madison, registering against Lisa Pugh from the, develop, or the Disability Rights Wisconsin, and registering in favor, Senator Van Wangard. With that, that will conclude uh, today's public hearing on uh, AB 194. Um, at this point, folks, I have no, uh, there is no scheduled exec for this bill. Uh, so I would just stay tuned to your email boxes should something arise. But uh, uh, this, I'm not quite sure when the next meeting will be at this point. So, with that, we'll stand adjourned. <laughs>